The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee for today, which is May 18th. I'm Lisa Goodman and I'll be chairing the committee today. Um, As we begin, I'll note for the record that Hello. this meeting has remote participation and perhaps we could mute all the other mics. Chair Goodman, in, in our effort to mute all the mics, it included yours, so unmute yourself, please. Thank you. As we begin, I'll note for the record, this meeting has remote participation by members of the City Council and City staff as authorized under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021 as a result of the declared local public health emergency. The City will be recording and posting the meeting to the City's website and YouTube channel as a way to increase public access and transparency. The meeting is public and subject to the open meeting law. At this time, I'll kindly ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for our meeting today. Council Member Reich. Present. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Osmond. Here. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Here. Chair Goodman. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum and Council Member Ellison is out with urgent business as it pertains to public safety and likely will be able to join us later. The, cons the agenda for today's meeting is in front of us. I'll begin with the consent agenda, which includes items 7 through 14 on the agenda. Item 7 are the liquor license approvals and item number 8 are the liquor license renewals. I'll note that there is a very large number of liquor license renewals, which is probably a good sign as it pertains to the city reopening. There are 135 of those. Item number 9 are the gambling license approvals. Item 10 is setting a public hearing on June 8th to consider a historic use variance. Item 11 is the Great, St Great Streets facade matching grant updates as well as the cultural district's improvement pilot program guidelines. Item number 12 is neighbor, neighbor Works Home Partners and Build Wealth Minnesota. It's a contract amendment for the Grow North pilot project. Item number 13 is a technical amendment to the George Floyd Square 38th and Chicago Forgivable Loan Program. Item 14 is a rezoning at 200 is there anything on the consent agenda, items 7 through 14, that anyone would like to pull off or discuss? Just looking to see if any council members have any items they'd like to pull off or discuss. Seeing none, I'm going to move the approval of items 7 through 14 and please ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the cons consent agenda is approved. We'll now move on to our public hearing portion of the agenda, starting with item number one, which is a PACE financing proposal given by Becky Shaw. Ms. Shaw, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. You have before you a request to pass a resolution adopting the assessment, levying the assessment, and adopting the assessment role for PACE Energy Financing in the amount of $50,000 for solar panels and related equipment for Landucci's 9th Street Flats. Landucci's 9th Street Flats is a 15-unit apartment building located at 334 9th Street Southeast requesting financing to purchase and install solar panels and related equipment to produce electricity for the building. The total project cost for installation and equipment is $50,000. An assessment amount of $50,000 will be placed on the property over the term of 10 years at a four and a quarter interest rate. The solar install will produce 18.45 kilowatt hours of electricity, leading to an estimated utility savings of $85,726 over 20 years. And we do have borrowers and lenders watching the committee remotely, but none have signed in to speak as far as I know. So let me know if there are any questions I can answer for you. Are there any questions for Ms. Shaw on item number one? 
Seeing none, I'm going to open the public hearing on item number one and see if there is anyone to speak. The clerk says that no one has signed up to speak. I'll just see if there's anyone here to speak to this item. If not, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and call on Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to move this item forward for approval. Further comments or questions on Council Member Schrader's motion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That item is approved. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Item number two is an interim use permit at 4040 Washington Avenue. Um, this is going to be presented by Mr. Liska. Mr. Liska, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Again, this item before you is 40, 50 and a half Washington Avenue North. Can IT please bring up the presentation? There was an interim use permit granted for uh, this site uh, two years ago, that interim use permit expires uh, in June. The applicant is back before the committee seeking an additional three years of operation. It is a tow lot. Uh, this is industrially zoned I-2. Uh, there is the tow yard up front uh, along Washington Avenue North, 4040. This uh, subject site is behind that. With, a, with an access road. The applicant, as a part of the original interim use permit, uh, made some site improvements in landscaping the yard along the tow lot along Washington. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, landscaping the yard along Washington Avenue North, as well as adding a concrete apron uh, where the vehicles are stored, as well as uh, installing new class five to industry standards. The applicant again is looking for three additional years with this interim use permit. Next slide, please. Staff is able to make all necessary findings associated with conditional use permits as well as interim use permits as required by the ordinance. With that, staff recommends approval of this worth mentioning. Uh, the applicant is aware and on board with a condition of approval that allows the city to terminate this application permit with 60 days notice. Uh, this site is in the area where uh, redevelopment may come sooner than later, uh, so uh, granting this would not delay any development. The applicant is present and I can answer any questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Liska, for your report. We'll see if there are any questions from Mr. Liska. Seeing none, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing and ask the clerk if there are any speakers in queue. I understand Kathy Osborne is in queue, so I would invite you to speak now, Ms. Osborne. Hello, can you? We can hear you, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Ah, good. Um, yes, we just would like to continue to use this property. It's connected to the same business as using it from on the 4040 side and then on this property as well. So um, I, have, I can answer questions if you need. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. We'll see if anyone else is in queue to speak to this issue. Anyone else in queue to speak to the issue? It does not seem like there is, so I'm going to proceed to close the public hearing on call on council member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, will be moving this item forward for approval. Um, it is not ideal. We did see this in zoning and planning two years ago, um, and we're really hoping for uh, kind of a better better use. This is, uh, we, we're not a big fan of having tow lots um, here in the city, uh, but that said, um, it is something that um, I really want to thank staff for their thoughtfulness um, as being able to make sure that any development, if it comes up, is able to move forward. Um, and again, just to reiterate, I'm, I'm, we'll be moving this forward for approval. On Council Member Schrader's motion to move approval, are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'd please ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. 
Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. We'll move on to item number three, which is El Treviso Taqueria in the 13th Ward. And I will invite Mr. Cervantes to give that report. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I am Max Cervantes, a lead liquor license inspector detailed to the first and fifth precincts. I'm presenting an application from El Treviso Taqueria owned by Kiki Ishamu Inc. The business address is 4953 Xerxes Avenue South, located in Ward 13. The applicant is requesting an upgrade to on-sale liquor, no live entertainment, and Sunday sales license from an on-sale wine and strong beer, no entertainment license. Their hours of operation are 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. daily. They have indoor seating for 30 and outdoor seating for 24. On April 26, 2021, uh, public hearing notices went were sent to residents and property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Multi-unit buildings were posted. Notices were also sent to the Fulton Neighborhood Association and Council Member Palmasano. We have received 85 comments from the community in favor and two comments that are opposed concerning parking and traffic. Zoning no longer requires businesses to provide parking for patrons or visitors. Uh, there have been no significant 311 or 911 calls attributed to the business. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on-sale liquor, no live entertainment, and Sunday sales license. This concludes my presentation. At this time, I'll stand for any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cervantes, for your report. We'll see if there are any questions. Seeing none, I'm going to proceed, proceed to open the public hearing, and I understand Mr. Ruiz is with us on the phone, um, and I would welcome you to speak, Mr. Ruiz, at this time. Is Hector Ruiz on the call? Press star six to unmute. Mr. Ruiz? Hello. Hello. Welcome Hello, to everyone. the call. We can hear you, sir. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone. So I'm uh, Hector Ruiz. Uh, owner of El Travieso, previous uh, Don Raul. Uh, so I'm just uh, trying to say, you know, that I tried to upgrade uh, my liquor license regarding because uh, a lot of my clients, you know, uh, since they went from a fine dining restaurant to uh, just a comfort food taqueria and everyone expect, you know, uh, to we can serve margarita. So that was one of my reasons that I kind of applied for the hard liquor license so i went to uh do that so uh but also you know the whole neighborhood in uh award uh 13 have been really grateful to me to kind of doing the changes and not really happy with that taqueria so that's the main reason why i kind of upgraded to a uh, full liquor license so Thank you so much for uh, being on the call today and thank you for all the great work you're doing in the city. Uh, we're happy to see you on the other end of the pandemic still operating one business in the city and we hope it will be more. Are there any other callers on the line for item number three? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and call on Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move this item forward for approval. Item number three has been moved for approval. Um, I just want to also note for the clerk that Council Member Ellison is attempting to call in but cannot get on the call. So someone might want to pay attention to that. Um, and on Council Member, Member Schrader's motion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That item is approved. We'll now move on to item number four. Um, and I will note for the record that Council Member Ellison has joined us. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. I will um, turn this over to Ms. Topinka to give her report. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman um, and committee members. Um, I'm Katie Topinka uh, with CPED here to present on the Renter Eviction Protections Ordinance. Um, and I believe there should be a presentation. There we go. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, so the Renter Eviction Protections Ordinance was introduced and referred to staff in February of this year. Um, the ordinance uh, before the committee today includes a pre-eviction filing notice requirement, which is uh, similar to an ordinance that was adopted by the City of St. Louis Park uh, last fall and went into effect there um, in February of this year. Um, staff recommends moving forward with this ordinance now um, in anticipation of the end of the statewide eviction moratorium. Um, and it also helps um, support other eviction prevention efforts going on in the city right now, which include um, funding for emergency rental assistance and for legal services. Um, we have contracts with uh, legal aid to provide eviction representation. Um, in addition to um, supporting other um, eviction prevention efforts, this ordinance builds on the body of uh, renter protections work that we have seen in the city over the last several years, including the Fair Chance Access to Housing Ordinance um, that addressed um, security deposits and screening criteria, um, and also the city's renter first policy. Um, one note um, I just wanted to mention here is that, um, as you'll likely recall, uh, council members, I did present um, on this uh, to Pogo in April. Um, and at that time, we shared we were also working on a, a just cause ordinance um, that we intended to model after the ordinance um, that St. Paul adopted last year. Um, since the, that time of the Pogo presentation, there was a court decision that resulted in an injunction um, on the St. Paul ordinance and staff have recommended at this time pausing on the just cause provision until there is more information about the court proceedings uh, around the St. Paul ordinance. Um, great, thank you. So next slide, um, this slide has information about uh, what's included in the um, ordinance that's before you today. Um, uh, it re requires that a property owner must provide a written notice to a renter at least 14 days before bringing an eviction action for non-payment of rent. So currently there is not any sort of notice period required. It, uh, a property owner could um, uh, file an eviction without any sort of written notice to the renter. So this would require that the property owner provide a 14 day written notice um, the notice must include information that includes the total amount due, specifics around um, what's due, including unpaid rent, late fees, or other charges, and then a name and address of the person authorized to receive the rent and fees on behalf of the landlord. Um, the notice must also provide a description of how to access legal and financial assistance through information posted on the city's website. Um, and then it, the ordinance states that a landlord may bring an eviction action following expiration of the 14 day notice period if the tenant fails to pay the total amount due. Um, the notice must be delivered in person or by first class mail. Um, it, in addition to though, it must be delivered by one of those methods. It can also be delivered by email. Um, so, uh, Next slide, please. Um, and then this is the last slide uh, in the presentation. Um, the ordinance would have an immediate effective date if it's um, adopted by the council. Um, so the effective date would be after it is adopted by the council, signed by the mayor and published. Um, implementation and enforcement will be led by regulatory services um, and it would uh, be led by their work group that consists of the alternative enforcement team, rental housing liaisons, and their administrative staff. And there are staff from regulatory services on, on the call today as well who can answer questions related to implementation and enforcement. Um, for uh, education about the ordinance, staff propose using funding from the American Rescue Plan Act to do communication and outreach to stakeholders. Um, and then enforcement um, would be on a complaint basis. Um, and that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Topinka, for your presentation. I'll see if there are any questions from members of the committee about your presentation. And seeing none, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing. We have over 40 people signed up to speak, so we're going to need to limit the public hearing to one minute per person. I will uh, let you know the next three people in line so you can be prepared to chime in when your name is called. And then just note that you press star six 
to unmute. If someone has already said something that you would say, just simply say, I agree. No need to take up the minute if you agree with previous speakers. I appreciate everyone's consideration. We have a very lengthy agenda after this, and we want, want to make sure everyone on all of their items can be heard. So we'll start with Allison Wheelage, followed by Pam LaPesca and Andre Duke. Allison, welcome. Okay, Allison is not on the line. We will hear from Pam LaPesca, followed by Andre Duke and Dan Coleman. Go ahead, Ms. LaPesca. Okay, we'll then move on. To, uh, Ms. LaPesca is not on the line. We'll move on to Andre Duke, followed by Dan Coleman and Susanna Dodge. Mr. Duke, are you on the line? Okay, uh, we don't hear now Mr. Duke, Mr. Coleman, followed by Susanna Dodge and Carlton Payne. Is Mr. Dan Coleman on the line? Followed by Ms. Susanna Dodge. Is Ms. Dodge on the line? Okay, um, then we will move on to, sorry, I got to go through the list, um, Carlman Payne. After Carlman Payne would be Megan Poehler, followed by Grace Burke. Okay, um, so if we don't have Ms. Polar, Ms. Burke, we'll move on to Michael Jimenez. Is Michael Jimenez on the line, followed by Janelle Beck and Shelby Webb? I'm sorry. This is Grace Berkey. I am here and ready, but I can I can wait till after Michael. Um, no, go ahead, Ms. Berkey. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Grace Berkey. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association. We believe a pre-eviction filing notice policy is a great tool to prevent displacement and aligns well with the stated goals of the city. However, we urge the council to implement a policy with a notification period of at least 30 days. PPNA operates the renter fund through CPED's Rental Stabilization Pilot Program. 75% of the renters we serve are people of color. In a recent survey, over 80% believed it would take them more than 14 days to cure a lease violation or find new housing, most identifying they would need 30 days or more. And they also say that it takes more than 21 days to receive emergency rental assistance through the state or county. The 14-day notice proposed is simply not enough time to effectively prevent displacement, and we know that displacement is catastrophic for individuals and communities. Additionally, this 30-day notice is consistent with state statutes that require 30-day notice to homeowners facing uh, foreclosure and statutes requiring 30-day notice to terminate a lease of 20 years or more. To give less than 30 days notice to residential renters who we know disproportionately represent low income and BIPOC communities is not only ineffective, but inequitable. Renters in Minneapolis deserve the right to cure a lease violation and prevent the loss of their homes, and they need at least 30 days to do it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll hear from Mr. Jimenez, followed by Janelle Beck and Shelby Webb. As Michael Jimenez on the line. Michael? If not, we'll move on to Janelle Beck. Is Janelle Beck on the line? Followed by Shelby Webb and Cecil Smith. If not Janelle Beck, then Shelby Webb. Is Shelby Webb on the line? Followed by Cecil Smith and Bruce Barron. If Ms. Webb is not on the line, we'll hear from Mr. Smith, followed by Bruce Barron and Simona. Um, Chereches, Chereches. Mr. Smith, are you on the line? I'm, I'm here, Madam Chair. You have one minute, Mr. Smith, welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Cecil Smith. I am President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. My members oppose this ordinance and believe it's unnecessary. The vast majority of owners already provide notice 
and an opportunity for residents to pay any rent arrears prior to an eviction filing action. The 14 day period is excessive and will create the risk of losing two months rent, <clears throat> which places a significant financial burden on the property. Owners are a for-profit business, business that rely on timely rent payments. It is infeasible for renters to stay in a unit for free while property owners have financial responsibilities such as mortgage payments. Owners will need to either remove the current grace period to pay without a late fee and immediately send out the 14-day notice, or they will replace the reminder letter with a notice of intent to file an eviction. This will negatively impact the renter manager relationship and start the process sooner, leading to more eviction filings. Only eight other states have a 14 day notice or greater requirement, but we currently have no notice period, and yet we have the fourth lowest eviction rate among all states. That is where we want to be or better. Don't do something that we believe could increase our filing rate. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We'll hear from Bruce Barron, followed by Simona. Ch Arachas, and then Amber Sachs. Mr. Barron, are you on the line? Hello? Mr. Barron, welcome. Yes, yes uh, Chairman and uh, other council members. Um, I speak in favor, but conditionally, of your 14-day ordinance. Um, uh, uh, I would say that from a practical or real-life standpoint, I question whether the ordinance does a, is a greater symbolic impact uh, as opposed to making a consequential difference in addressing some of the concerns of, uh, uh, of those evicted. I would say that there are two categories I would speak to. One is the current but late uh, individual, somebody who's paid their back rent, but they're late on this month's rent. I can see a landlord, and maybe I would do this, would then create a new letter that says you're late, uh, late notice, put it out on day two with rent due on day one, uh, and include in there now a, a notice of eviction that says that uh, uh, should you fail, fail, uh, fail to pay by a certain date, this is your notice for eviction. That yeah. would step up uh, uh, the heat on a situation unduly, and, uh, but that would be you know, a way to comply. When we have a tenant in arrears, it's my belief that every tenant that isn't paying rent knows it, and every landlord knows it too, and consequentially has been providing written notice to uh, almost every tenant situation, if nothing else, that, so that they can present that uh, uh, a notice uh, for emergency assistance, and uh, which is what, you know, in everybody's instance, you know, getting paid is what they want. Um, so, I the, the notice period doesn't bother me. We always use the 30-day period. Um, the question is, you know, comes down to what do you think you're going to accomplish? And, uh, you know, are you really going to belay or delay uh, enforcement? Um, this should not apply to any, uh, to any circumstance that's not financial, such as a criminal activity, uh, danger to property, uh, concerns for imminent harm, uh, those types of uh, concerns. Uh, uh, Mr. Barron, sir, you have gone well over a minute. I'm sorry we didn't tell you that. I was under the impression the clerk was going to give everyone the one minute warning, but he was not. Could you conclude your comments, not please? A, not a problem. I wish you all well. I think you got the gist of what I have to say. We did, sir. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from Simona Chiraches, followed by Amber Sachs and Lisa Moe. Hi, my name is Lisa Moe. Good afternoon, Chairman. I am President and CEO of Stewart Companies. Our company manages over 6,000 units in Minnesota, including a variety of affordable housing and market rate units. I have over 30 years of experience. While this proposed ordinance may be well intended, it will have the complete opposite effect of stabilized housing. As a housing provider, filing an eviction is last resort in all cases. Prior to Governor Walz's eviction moratorium, I pulled our company data and found that for 6,000 units of housing, on average, we file less than 10 UDs on an annual basis. This legal action is our last step. Pre-eviction moratorium, our approach was to work with renters that had experienced financial crisis by providing resources and programs to assist them. Majority of non-payment of rent is due to an event and usually a one-time experience. With your ordinance, our approach will change dramatically, change this process dramatically, require us as reputable landlords to put renters on notice the eviction filing on day two each month. 
This notice will come as a cost that will be absorbed by the renter who is already struggling for funds. This ordinance will create a very adversarial relationship between us and our renters and will add the difficulties of the renter and the future housing needs. This ordinance in its current form and your action of passing this ordinance will compound the affordable housing crisis versus providing any level of stabilization. This committee and the City of Minneapolis could use their resources to, to assist the existing state program, Rent Help Minnesota, and to distribute the avail available funds to those in need of assistance. The current program is not functional, nor demonstrating any indication of this, that, that this may change. I'd recommend the committee table this action and redirect your resources. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I am going to just go back to make sure that um, the two people before Lisa Mo, if they were on the line, had the opportunity to speak. That would be Simona Tereches and Amber Sachs. If either of you are on the line, please press star six to unmute. If not, we will move on to Paul Berg, followed by Ryan McCann. Mr. Berg, are you on the line? Hi, this is Amber Sachs. Thank yes, you, Amber. I am on the line. Okay. Yes. Um, um, uh, hang on. Mr. Berg will ask you to hold so that we can hear from Ms. Sachs first. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Amber Sachs. I'm portfolio manager with First Select Property Management. We have a property in Minneapolis right now and currently had some previously. Um, in our attempts to work with residents, we provide a notice to them on the fifth of the month. I believe many landlords do the same thing. Rents are due on the first. They have a grace period through the fourth without a late fee or any um, threat of having an eviction filed. As of the 5th, we notify our residents. We give them until the 10th of the month before we file or the 7th if this resident has been a regular late payer. We notify them ahead of time before we start doing it on the 7th. I believe that implementing this ordinance of giving them 14 days is going to push evictions into a second month, whereas currently we can sometimes get a non-payer out of the property at the end of a month. However, implementing a 14-day rule will cause us to go into a second month. This is going to take more time and more. Thank you for your testimony. Um, the, because I don't want to be interrupting people, the mic is just simply going to be cutting people off when you hit one minute. Um, so I believe that was Ms. Mo, but it was either Ms. Sachs or Ms. Mo. Yes, Ms. Sachs. Great. That was Ms. Sachs or this is Ms. Sachs? This is Ms. Sachs. I was cut oh. off. Okay, your minute is up. Thank you. We'll then move on to Ms. Mo, followed by Mr. Berg. Is Ms. Mo on the call? Ms. Mo already spoke. Okay, we'll move on to Mr. Berg, followed by Ryan McCann. Mr. Berg, I know you're on the call. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a property owner. I agree with the previous uh, callers that said that this would just simply add two weeks to an already lengthy process. It's the it's the it's really the last resort if we're going to evict somebody. We've probably worked with them for a long time and they know that an eviction is coming if it's gonna actually come. I'm also, in addition to a property owner, I'm vice president at Sunrise Banks. We've worked through the PPP loans, the EIDL loans, all the, all the loans that are available to these um, individuals. I make them all aware who's hiring, you know, what, what relief is available. And I can tell you that everybody is able to get relief except the landlords. So- Thank you for um, your testimony, Mr. Berg. We'll move on now to Brian Ryan McCann, followed by Daisy Lomely. Is Mr. McCann on the call? If Ryan McCann is not on the call, we'll call on Daisy Lomely, followed by James Taylor. Is Daisy on the call? If Daisy Lomely is not on the call, is Mr. James Taylor on the call, followed by Leah Baker. Is James Taylor on the call? If Mr. Taylor is not on the call, we will call on Ms. Baker, 
followed by Aaron West. Is Ms. Baker on the call? If Ms. Baker is not on the call, we will hear from Aaron West. If Ms. West, Hello. is this Ms. West? Hello, this is Aaron West. Um, I work as a tenant organizer from Homeline, a tenant advocacy organization that advises and engages with renters statewide. I'm here today to ask that City Council act quickly to pass a 30-day pre-eviction notice. Homeline has advised over 37,000 households about eviction actions filed in court and provided critical advice to protect tenants from forced displacement and homelessness. The current timeline for Minnesota's eviction process can be as brief as 7 to 14 days, one of the shortest in the nation. And despite wide spread acknowledgement that pre-eviction notice is best practice and it is the law in most other states, Minnesota law does not require landlords to warn a tenant prior to filing an eviction in court and creating a public record. This extremely rapid timeline means that many tenants struggle to understand their rights or know where to go for financial assistance. There's no opportunity for the tenant to amend a mistake, negotiate, or leave before an eviction is filed. At worst, an eviction in Minnesota can mean that tenants go from having a home one week to being thrown out by a sheriff the next. Uh, given the economic downturn uh, caused by the pandemic and many other impacts on tenants' financial stability, we expect post-moratorium eviction. Okay, thank you for your testimony. I wish we had a way to warn people in advance that did not involve interrupting, but unfortunately we don't. But I am going to ask if Mr. McCann or Daisy Lomely or James Taylor are on the call. Ryan McCann, followed by Daisy Lomely. followed by James Taylor. Okay, Hello. the next. Uh, my name is Allison Waylogging. My name was the first one called. I apologize, I was having some technical difficulties. Please go ahead now. You have one minute. Thank you. Uh, my name is Allison. I am a owner-occupied landlord and I do not have an issue with uh, money being paid. But I just wanna remind people that Landlords get picked on too, especially small landlords. And we've got a lot on the line here. We've got retirement accounts that we may have to dig into. We have savings accounts that are eaten up. And at any moment, I know that my tenant can turn back around and take things from me that I've worked very hard for. So I, I just want to point that out, that tenants can pick on people too. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will call on Leah Baker or Margaret Kaplan. This is Margaret. Margaret, thank you. You have one minute. Excellent. Uh, well, good afternoon. My name is Margaret Kaplan, and I'm the president of the Housing Justice Center. Uh, firstly, we commend the council for bringing forward this important policy. The notification requirements are well thought out to ensure that renters have access to the information about both what they owe and information about services that they need to access before they lose their homes. As we've heard, as we've heard some landlords do this as, as a matter of course, but let's remember, many landlords do not. Currently, we've been working with renters across the state navigating the rental assistance process, and frankly, the process takes time. If we want to provide legal services and allow people to access rental assistance, more time is necessary. Even prior to the COVID public health crisis, 14 days would be insufficient to access legal and financial assistance. If we want this policy to do what it's intended, allow people to access resources before an eviction is filed, we would ask the council extend the pre-filing notice to a minimum of 30 days. The good news is that landlords will get paid. This is not a requirement that they, they accept a dime less than the rent that's owed to them. However, there is real harm that people experience. I'll thank Ms. Kaplan for her comments and we'll move on to Tram Hang. Is Tram on the line? Followed by Nadia Hecker O'Brien. So is Tram. Hi, this is Tram Huang. Tram Huang, thank you for being here. You have one minute. Thank you. My name is Tom Huang, and I live at 41st and Snelly Avenue in the Hiawatha neighborhood in War 12. I'm also a policy advocate at the Alliance, and I'm calling in support of the pre-eviction notice policy and ask that you extend the notice period to 30 days for reasons related to our current housing landscape, as well as to add a sense of humanity to our housing system. 
from my work at the Alliance, working closely with organizations like Housing Justice Center who are helping tenants apply for rental assistance, we know it is taking far longer than 14 days to access rental assistance. The process is even more inaccessible for people whose first language is not English or for those who have limited access to internet, scanners, and other equipment required to go through the process, which disproportionately impacts renters. Every single day matters to someone who is anxiously waiting for rental assistance. It is a matter of staying housed or becoming houseless. From a more practical standpoint, I simply don't think 14 days notice is humane to expect a family to be able to transition into new housing. I recently purchased a home and even the four weeks that I had to move from my apartment to my home was extremely stressful. And this is with the many privileges of being able to take time off from work, not having to worry about transferring kids to new schools, I want to thank you for your testimony. We will move on to Nadia Hecker O'Brien, followed by Jennifer Zhang. Are Jennifer or Nadia on the line? Yes. Nadia. Great. Nadia, welcome. Thank you. You have one minute, ma'am. Hi, my name is Nadia. I'm a housing caseworker serving the South Metro. Based on my experience working in homelessness prevention for the past three years, I'm in favor of the Renters Protection Eviction Ordinance and second the call for a 30-day notice. The new state COVID-19 Rent Assistant Program, which is supposed to assist those struggling to pay rent, has not yet received released a single payment. Even as a tech-savvy professional who works in housing, I found this application to be incredibly difficult. This is all to say that the large-scale programs renters are reliant on do not move quickly or intuitively enough to allow for the quick pace evictions currently taking place in Minnesota. This is not simply an issue that has arisen through the pandemic. Hennepin County Emergency Assistance, which is what many folks rely on for rent assistance, takes 30 days to process. People go to court and experience eviction just waiting for support systems to come through. This is a waste of time and money for landlords and tenants alike. We must provide advance notice to our community's renters to provide some ability to make a plan, get legal assistance, and most importantly, prevent mass homelessness. Like most things, prevention works a whole lot better than starting from square one. It's better for our people, it's most cost efficient, and it's better for our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Nadia. We'll move on to Alabella Rodriguez or Jennifer Jang. Jennifer? Yes, Bob. I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead. You um, have a minute. Hi. Sure. Uh, my, my name is Jen Jang and I live in the Phillips neighborhood. I'm also a housing organizer with Renters United for Justice and a policy for a 14 day notice of eviction barely even scratches the surface of the kind of support renters need from their community leaders such as yourself. Um, I believe a policy like this is the bare minimum of what council could be doing because housing is a human right. It's not debatable or controversial. Your constituents need and deserve safe, dignified housing. I believe our city could be a leader in the fight for renters' rights, and instead we are behind. That's why we need more than 14 days. We need at least, at least 60. Renters need protection from predatory landlords, especially in this time of crisis, and you all have done nothing. Please continue to support stronger renter protections in the future and a 60-day notice for eviction. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear now from Alabella Rodriguez or Louise Caguna. Alibella or Louise, if you're on the line, please feel free to press star six to unmute. If not, we'll move on to Ariana Anderson, followed by Steve Berg. Is Ms. Anderson on the line? If not Ms. Anderson, is Mr. Berg on the Hello, line? Hello, this is Ms. Anderson. This is Ariana Anderson. I live in the McKinley neighborhood. Welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, we need at least 14 days, at least 14 days for to access resources so that people are not homelessness. Homeless. Homelessness is a health crisis. There's there's a rise in AIDS and all different kind of things. People are there's tents going up everywhere, and I personally have been affected by homelessness because when I was 19 years old, I was I had 24 hours to get out of my apartment and I lost everything. I have a UD to this day and I've been subjected to slumlords and abusive relationships just to have housing. Uh, right now, people are in the, in the situation where there's a pandemic and they cannot find work or they've been forced out of the jobs that they've already had and they cannot afford, we cannot afford as a community to allow this to happen. Thank you for your testimony. 
we'll next hear from Steve Berg, followed by Deanna Ronning. Is Mr. Berg on the call? Is Deanna Ronning on the call? Please press star six to unmute. If neither of them are on the call, the next person would be Carl Kruger, followed by Vanessa Del Campo. Mr. Kruger or Ms. Del Campo, you are welcome to press star six to unmute. Hi, this is Carl. Go ahead, sir. Hello? Go ahead. You have one minute, sir. Mm, okay. Uh, my name's Carl. I've been a landlord in North Minneapolis for 13 years. I have 31 tenants. And I can tell you uh, that I weigh evictions very carefully. They cost a lot of money. I give all my tenants a lot of time to put money together to pay their evictions or their rent. The last three people that I have lost or evicted have cost me five, six, and eight thousand dollars a piece. What you folks will do by putting 14 days or more onto this period is just make affordable housing more expensive. Um, landlords like me are already out a lot of money, people not paying their rent, and this is just gonna be more costly and we will raise our rents to compensate. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll ask if Ms. Vanessa Del Campo is on the line. Me? Yes, is this Vanessa? Vanessa Del Campo or Deanna Ronning? No, who are they? See? Yes, you can't, you can't. Okay, is there a translator potentially for Ms. De Campo? Uh, yes. Okay. Could you assist in helping her provide her testimony? Es que no quiere. Puede hablar, puede dar su testimonio. Buena. Hello? We can hear you, sir. Are you translating for Ms. DeCampo? Bueno, yes, sí. I am. Sí. Uh, hello, yes. Ah, sí, sí. Yes. Sí. Yes. Eh, mi nombre es Vanessa del Campo. My name is Vanessa vivo, del Campo. Vivo en el vecindario Corcoran. I live in the Corcoran neighborhood. Soy parte de la organización Inquilinos Unidos. I'm part of the, the Inquilinos Unidos organization. Como inquilinos, eh, necesitamos más protección. As renters, we need more protection. Creo que vivir un desalojo es muy, un proceso traumatizante. Uh, I think that the, living through an uh, eviction is a, a traumatizing experience. Para cada integrante de familia. It's for, for every member of the family. Eh, actualmente estamos sobreviviendo a una pandemia. Uh, right now, we're surviving during a pandemic. Y creo que es difícil eh, pensar que no podemos sobrevivir a un desalojo. And I, I think it's hard to thinking that uh, we wouldn't be able to survive uh, being evicted. Estamos necesitados de soluciones reales. And, and we need real solutions. Esta no es una solución. This is not a solution. Con avisos anticipados. With the uh, early uh, notice. Y con recursos que hagan que las familias no pasen por un proceso así. And for the uh, resources that are provided for families, they don't go through a process like that. Y lo más importante es tener hogares para todos. And the most important thing is uh, to have uh, housing for everyone. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I just want to go back to see if Ariana Anderson is on the line. Ms. Anderson, if you're on the line, you're welcome to press star six to unmute. Luis Caguana is here to speak. He needs an interpreter too. Okay, great. 
Um, so, mi nombre es Luis Cabana. Vivo por, por sur de Minneapolis. Soy parte de la organización. I live in uh, South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Soy parte de la organización Incluyendo Sonido para Justicia. Yeah, and I'm part of the uh, organization Inclinos Unidos uh, para Justicia, uh, Renters United for Justice. Queremos, queremos pedir favor a la ciudad inspeccione de cada apartamento si está pésimas condiciones. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, fully interpreted. Please, um, if you could repeat, si puede repetir lo que dijo un poquito más despacio, por favor. El, los dueños quieren desalojar sin, sin dar soluciones para desalojo son no, número uno. Yeah, and, and then uh, the children that are uh, evicted uh, for no reason, that is, uh, that's uh, the number one thing. Nosotros vivimos los, como rentero cinco años, diez años, quince hasta veinte años. Yeah, and uh, as runners, we're, we're living in these places five, uh, ten, uh, even up to 50, up to 20 years. Los niños están enseñados en ese, en ese lugar, con vecinos, las escuelas, todo eso, y los dueños quieren desalojar, no dan una oportunidad, por lo menos unos dos meses anticipado. And the children that, that are evicted, uh, uh, they leave uh, their uh, oh, friends, neighborhoods at school, uh, and... Uh, they need at least uh, two two months to be notified. Porque niños están traumados porque no tienen los amigos, vecinos, todo está en un solo lugar como buenos vecinos y eso niños sufren. And the children uh, end up being traumatized uh, because they don't have their friends, they don't have their neighbors. Uh, it's uh, and they suffer. Okay, that, unfortunately, that was about four minutes. So we'll go ahead to the next person, which would be Ariana Anderson, followed by Steve Berg. Ms. Anderson or Mr. Berg, are you present? Oh, we're going on, I'm sorry. Uh, we're down to Ariana Feldman. Uh, hello, this is Ariana Feldman. Um, yeah. I believe I was next in line. Um, I first want to see, I, I believe that Alibeya Rodriguez is also on the line. Um, she was earlier and also needs a translator. Alibeya, si está conectada, puede oprimir estrella 6 para hablar? Alibeya? Bueno. Okay. Um, we don't. We need to get our act together here. Let's see if we can get the interpreter on the line with the appropriate person. The interpreter is on the line. And the person who is next speaking, who was not on before, is who? ¿Y quién es la persona que está en la línea que está hablando en este momento? Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alibella Rodríguez. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Alivea Rodriguez. Great, thank you. Sí, mire, yo voy a dar mi testimonio de lo que he pasado. Yeah, I'm going to give my uh, I'm going to give my testimony about what I've uh, experienced uh, along with my family. Okay, and I want you to be aware you have two minutes, and the mic's going to cut off. So make sure she's aware of that. Tuvimos un desalojo, tres desalojos en el 2018. We went through uh, three evictions in uh, uh, in 2018. And the first one, they told us that we had to leave the building without giving us any justification. En ese momento yo no sabía qué hacer, este, en don, para dónde ir, y me acordé de Inquilinos Unidos. Acudí At a ellos. Time, I, at that time, I didn't know uh, what to do or where to go, so I uh, went to the Inquilinos Unidos. 
y empezamos a tener reuniones, pues, incluso el dueño no nos daba en sí una dirección exacta donde podíamos comunicarnos con él. Yeah, and uh, we started to have meetings. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, owner hadn't even given us an address uh, at which we'd be able to contact them. La dirección en la que yo vivía antes era 3720 de la Minnesota Avenue. The address that I lived at previously was at 3720 Minnesota Avenue. And then they sent us another notification that we had to leave. And, and we didn't understand that, that uh, we, we had to, to leave the, the unit. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up, please. Y nos pudimos en contacto con Inquilinos Unidos y con los abogados, así que pudimos hablar con el dueño. And so we got in contact with Inquilinos Unidos and with the attorneys, and so we were able to talk with the uh, owner. Okay, thank you for your testimony. We're going to have to move on to the next person, and that would be Ariana Feldman followed by Denise Herrera. Ms. Feldman, are you on the call? Please Hello. press. Hi, this is Ariana Feldman. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, uh, I am a uh, renter in South Minneapolis and also an organizer with United Renters for Justice. I'm calling today because of the dire need for protections for evictions against evictions overall in Minneapolis. Uh, we're facing a very real crisis of evictions in our city when the eviction moratorium is lifted and real crisis calls for real solution. Um, honestly, in my work working with renters, I've seen the need for many more than 14 days notice um, to uh, arrange a payment plan or to uh, secure other um, housing. But really, I, I'm here because um, you have a responsibility as city leaders to put people over profit, and this is a moment to uh, prioritize people to protect people in our city, and I do not want to see all of my neighbors be pushed out of the city. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll next hear from Denise Herrera, followed by Deborah Goodlaxon. Is Ms. Herrera on the line? If not, is Ms. Goodlaxon on the line? Either of you could press star six to unmute. If not, we will move on to Steve Shackman. Is Mr. Shackman on the line? Much, uh, my Mr. Shackman, you have one minute. Owner. I've been an owner operator in the city of Minneapolis for 53 years. First of all, the clear language lease clearly indicates the actions that you're requiring us to do. So we already have that in there, number one. Number two, if it's 14 days, that comes in an additional seven days till you get into court, minimally, and an additional seven days if the order is stayed. So now you're talking 28 to 31 extra days, possibly going into three months. We've already educated our tenants. We have all the information in our lobbies. We don't want to evict tenants. Let's go back to the home and lawsuit uh, structure and start educating our residents and working with them. Um, we, this ordinance will continue to drive good, responsible landlords out of the city of Minneapolis. Uh, I speak with experience uh, after the many years in architecting the housing court. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now hear from Liz Bronk, followed by Mark Anthony Foreman. Is Ms. Bronk on the line or Mr. Foreman? Ms. Bronk or Mr. Foreman? I'll then ask if Amy Gagne or Paula Foley are on the line. Mr. Foreman is on the line. Mr. Foreman, please feel free to go ahead. You have one minute. Is Amy Gagne? Yes, I am. Uh, Amy, we'll take you next. Thank you. Go ahead, yes, Mr. Foreman. I disagree with the ordinance. I do disagree with the ordinance from what our prior people have mentioned. But no one seemed to mention that we seem to have a requirement okay. to let the tenant know about financial services as well as legal services. So if I'm trying to evict the tenant, I shouldn't have to tell them how to defend themselves 
against me evicting them. And it seems like the ordinance is requiring us to let them know about their legal legal advice as well. Is that true? I can't answer your question, sir. This is your time for testimony. Okay, so as a landlord, if I'm evicting a tenant, I'm not going to tell them how to defend themselves against me because I do want them out. And most tenants know well in advance that they owe the landlord. So if they know by the 15th of the prior month that they can't make rent on the 1st, why are we having to reach out to them on the 1st to tell them that they owe us? So they already have plenty of time from the 15th to the 1st to seek financial advice. They shouldn't seek it out as soon as we tell them that they owe rent. And I can tell you from my experience that if a tenant applies for emergency assistance, I do not evict them. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Foreman. We'll check one more time for Liz Bronk, followed by Amy Gagne. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Amy Gagne. I'm the general manager for Sella Investments. We have 21 properties in Minneapolis with 376 units. I'm here to speak against the proposed ordinance. By imposing a 14-day notice requirement, tenants would be given the impression that rent was not due until the 14th day of each month. With a 14th day notice requirement, in order to preserve our rights, we would have to send our notices out every month to every tenant on the second day of the month, as soon as the tenants are late with their rent. Lastly, many tenants have long rent ledgers that are many, many pages long. And uh, so including the ledgers with the notices would require a lot of unnecessary payment papers. Uh, while landlords are often painted as the bad guy, we provide needed housing for countless households in the city of Minneapolis. For well over a year, we have suffered along with our tenants with the hardships caused by the pandemic. As we approach the end of this stressful time, we ask that we not be saddled with additional administrative burdens, and we urge you to vote against this ordinance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll hear from Paula Foley or Carl Omle. Is either Paula Foley or Carl Omley on the line? This is Paula Foley. Please go ahead, ma'am. You have one minute. Hi, um, I am with, a, we, we own properties in uh, Minneapolis and I would say we are against this um, ordinance and I kind of echo all the other comments from other property owners. I think it sets up a very adversarial relationship between landlords and tenants and it's not going to solve any of the issues with affordable housing. So I, I would ask you to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The last speaker we have is Carl Amle. A-M-L-I-E. Is Carl on the line? I don't believe he is on the line. Uh, so I'm going to see if there is anyone on the line who called in that hasn't been able to speak yet. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, I am going to see if there, I will go ahead and close the public hearing and open the discussion for my colleagues. If you'd like to speak, just please put your name in the chat. Councilmember Osman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I do want to take the time to thank uh, Council President Bender, uh, Council, uh, Council Member Allison, and Gordon for uh, taking this uh, important step protecting the residents. Uh, as someone coming from a uh, resident advocacy background and um, uh, tenant rights, uh, having protecting the resident, it's uh, it's something we have to do as a legislative, as an elected official. Um, we hear a lot of um, uh, advocate uh, residents that spoke and talk about their real life of uh, what happened to them. Uh, I'm coming from a large uh, ward that has over 90% renters. As my experience, I have noticed uh, many landlords and many property managers uh, uh, do not respect the people's uh, uh, tenants' rights. And majority of the residents have uh, a lot of barriers when it comes to language and knowing uh, their rights. Uh, I think uh, 14 days is not even enough for, for them to have those uh, uh, notices. Uh, I would advocate more having uh, 30 days and more and uh, protecting this residents, especially the time we're in at the moment and the time we are uh, 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 
because of so much, so much difficulties uh, that our community and our renters, our residents are facing. Uh, so I really want to thank uh, uh, individuals that spoke and also the council members that brought this forward. And I would encourage uh, regulatory services and their staff to really uh, make sure that uh, we are enforcing this loss. We're burning. There's a lot of protection laws that many residents are not aware of. Uh, and I would just I'll go as far as saying that uh, not just a non-payment uh, eviction, but also any other eviction, uh, individuals and renters and families should have uh, uh, noticed for why are they getting evicted. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much. I really appreciate um, folks who came, and I appreciate that, Councilmember Osman. I'd like to. Um, Propose that we extend the time from 14 days. Um, I do have an amendment uh, for consideration by the committee um, to extend it to 30 days. I will say that we um, discussed this several times uh, as a group, and we thought the 14 day was a good um, starting point for our committee here, but amongst ourselves in terms of the group and with staff. Um, we were concerned that it should be longer. We based the 14 days on um, what the state has been talking about and others. Um, so I'll move the 30 day for consideration. Also open to 21 days. Okay. Is there anyone else? I, I guess I would say, Council Member Gordon, that if you read the city attorney's guidance, he was very clear on at what point this would be considered something that would be subject to litigation and that what happened in St. Louis Park was not, but anything that is greater likely will be. So you're probably allowing the fantastic to get in the way of the good. And I think you're inviting litigation. And so I guess if you just wanna make a point and have it enjoined and not pass, go ahead and do this. <laughs> make all the political points we want, but it doesn't help anyone if we're sued over it. And so I just want you to keep that in mind. Council Member Ellison. <clears throat> um, thank you, Chair Goodman. I um, uh, I am worried about uh, um, uh, this policy uh, again. To Councilmember Goodman's point, um, just getting shut down uh, 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 right out of the gate. And so, um, while I do feel like 14 days is entirely too short, I also am mindful of um, the city attorney's. Uh, um, recommendation that we get not get too far away from uh from 14 days i do think that 14 days is incredibly too short and so i, I welcome discussion uh, i do think that there's a um i'm not yet proposing that i might before the meeting ends uh, i do think that there's a a logic to us going to 24 days um that falls in line with i think the last um data we got with regards to how long on average it takes for uh, folks to get access to um uh to rental assistance from the county uh again uh, I, I thought it was i see uh councilman gordon asked 21 but I, I thought 24 days was the average uh, number of days it took for folks to get uh help from the county um but 21 or 24 i, I think would would maybe get put us in a little bit better legal standing um uh, but I'm open to, but I'm not yet proposing it open to the discussion. And I see council member, other council members in the chat. Um, council member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to, I'll defer my time. I can go after council member Gordon if he wants to respond. Council member Gordon. Well, I would consider 24 certainly a friendly amendment. I remember we did discuss that as well. We hear different things about how long things take to get done. Um, but 24 is reasonable. I'm. I guess I'll let the discussion continue before suggesting it. But if you want to, uh, Councilmember Ellison, that would, I'd accept that as a friendly amendment. Um, Councilmember Schrader. Uh, thank you. I, I also just have the same concerns uh, that Councilmember Ellison and it did, and and yourself, Madam Chair, just about the legality. I want to make sure that this is something that that can pass. Uh, I think the I completely agree with the testifiers to say this is entirely too short. I do like the 
um, idea of making sure that the timeline is at least as long as it's, it takes people to access uh, services at the county and at the state. Um, and I'm not sure if Councilmember Gordon would be open to this, but I would prefer that this come up, uh, maybe be uh, something that can be changed next Friday at the full council meeting. So there'd be time to talk, talk with colleagues as well as the city attorney. Do you guys Gordon? have no right legislating on this. You have no business in landlords business like this, and you're going to. I, I would ask the clerk, yes, please, to control the um, comments online. Council member Gordon. Um, but first, I guess we'll hear from uh, Council Member Topinka. <laughs> Ms. Topinka. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I just thought it might be helpful to just um, share what the current information we understand from Hennepin County about the length of time it's taking for emergency assistance and um, emergency general assistance. This is separate from the um, uh, emergency rental assistance program program that's currently available specifically for COVID response. This is our standard uh, EA and EGA. For this uh, fiscal year for um, emergency general assistance, it's taking uh, a, an average of 20 days to process. And for emergency assistance, it's taking an average of 14 days. There, uh, Hennepin County staff shared there are a lot of reasons that can go faster or slower. Some of it is depending on how quickly paperwork gets in and all sorts of factors. But those are the current averages um, and um, EA uh, uh, people can receive twice in a calendar year. EGA it's once per 12 month period. Um, so I just wanted to thought that might be helpful to hear for this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Pinka, Ms. Uh, Council Member Gordon. So I'm comfortable taking Council Member um, Schrader's advice and um, waiting on this. I think we have 21, 24, 14, 30 um, uh, work that we could do between now and Committee of the Whole um, to, to come forward with a, an amendment. So um, I can't remember the council rules and don't have my council book in front of me, um, but I will withdraw uh, my amendment, especially without objection from my colleagues, and do some work on this before Committee of the Whole. Uh, especially in recognition of the lengthy committee meeting that we have today. Council Member Gordon, could I convince you to move this forward without recommendation so it keeps moving through the process? The uh, the whole thing moving forward without recommendation? Well, sure. yes, we, we have to have a motion to move something forward, yep. otherwise it's going to be stuck in committee, and I think um, I mean, time is an issue. I'm convinced. Oh. I'll move it forward. <laughs> so I would say if you want to do it, let's move it forward without recommendation and you can discuss the amount of time and the legality and the great versus the fantastic all at Committee of the Whole. Yes, I will. Or maybe the mediocre versus the good versus the fantastic. OK. Sure. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the uh, we'll see if there's any other discussion. Um, if not, then we will go ahead and take Council Member Gordon's motion to move this forward without recommendation. I would please ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That item will be moving forward to Committee of the Whole, chaired by Council Member Ellison next week. We'll then move on to our quasi-judicial portion of the public hearing. We have two of those, starting with item number five, which is a variance appeal at 49, 4933-32nd Avenue South. And I would ask Mr. Coolhouse to give that report. Thank you, Chair Goodman and members of the committee. Could IT staff pull up a copy of the slides? Thank you. Uh, this item is an appeal of a decision of the Zoning Board of Adjustment denying a variance to the required front yard for construction of a new single family dwelling at 4933 32nd Avenue South. The appellant in this case is the current property owner, Nick Elders, who is also the applicant for the original variance request. The subject property is located in the R1A multiple family district the interior to build form overlay district and the AP airport overlay. 
uh, this is a uh, aerial photograph showing the existing property. I think this is from a couple years ago. It has a current lot area of 7,425 square feet and a lot width just under 50 feet. You can see the existing dwelling on the uh, left side of the property, which is set back slightly farther than that adjacent neighbor to the south, but is set back quite a bit further from that uh, other neighbor on the north side. And they also have two existing detached garages in the rear yard. One larger and newer garage on the north side, which uh, was constructed under land use application approvals in 1999, and those were uh, brought forward by a previous owner, uh, not the current property owner, who is also the appellant in this case. And that other existing garage is uh, smaller and older. It's in the very kind of southeast corner right next to the alley. Next slide, please. And we can stay on this slide for the rest of my presentation. Uh, the appellant is proposing to demolish the existing dwelling uh, on the subject property and construct a new two-story single-family dwelling. They're also proposing to demolish that uh, smaller older garage in the southeast corner and restore that area as open yard space, but they would uh, be retaining that newer larger garage on the north side. The district standard minimum front yard for the interior two built form overlay district is 20 feet. However, the zoning code requires an increased minimum front yard when either of the neighboring houses are set back further than that district standard. That's the case here. So the minimum required front yard for the subject property is determined by the line drawn between the corners of the neighboring houses nearest their own front lot lines, not including any permitted obstructions like open porches or vestibules. You can see that line drawn between the uh, neighboring houses on, on the applicant's proposed survey. The front of the proposed dwelling would have an open covered front porch and some eave overhangs, which are permitted obstructions within a required front yard. The rest of the proposed dwelling is subject to the minimum front yard requirements, including a proposed cantilever on the upper level front of the house. This cantilever would extend uh, two feet closer to the front lot line than the main level building bulk. The nearest corner of that cantilever would be set back 20.1 feet from the front lot line based on the, the proposal shown on this survey here. Uh, at, this cantilever is not a permitted obstruction in a required yard, so this is kind of where that uh, initial request of 20.1 feet is, is being determined from. But again, much of the proposed building bulk on both levels would be within that required uh, front setback determined by the line drawn between the fronts of the neighboring houses. Uh, the appellants requested this variance to uh, reduce the required front yard to 20.1 feet. At the Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting on April 22nd, 2021, the board denied this request following staff recommendation and findings, and the appellants again are appealing that decision. As the members of the committee are aware, there are three required findings that must be considered for all variance applications. And I'll just touch on uh, staff analysis for each of those briefly. For the first required finding regarding practical difficulty due to unique circumstances of the property, not created by persons presently having an interest in the property and not based on economic considerations alone, staff finds that this is not met. The subject property has a lot area exceeding 7,000 square feet. It's just under 50 feet wide and just under 150 feet deep. Many residential properties in Minneapolis are a little bit smaller than this, uh, but single family lots to, of, of this size are not uncommon, especially in, in uh, lower density residential areas in, in Minneapolis. Even though that neighboring house to the north is set back relatively far uh, from its front lot line, which results in the greater minimum required front yard for the subject property, there is still a, a lot of space, about 57 feet in between the greatest extent of that front setback line and the front of that garage, which is the limiting factor on the other side. Uh, still a lot of space to, to fit a house in there. And with that other garage on the subject property being removed, there would still be some open space available in, in the rear and, and side yards for semi-private use, even if the proposed dwelling was located, located further back on the property. For the second finding regarding reasonable use of the property in keeping with the spirit and intent of the ordinance and the comprehensive plan, the general intent of setback requirements like this is to promote the orderly development and use of land, to provide for adequate light, air, and open space, and to ensure adequate separation of uses. With this uh, front yard requirement for small scale residential uses, the specific intent is to you know, promote uniformity of front yard space across an entire residential block base. I think ideally every house in the block would have a, a similar front setback, although obviously we know that is not always the case. And it's not necessarily uncommon to have some houses closer or further from the front lot line than other uh, neighboring houses. When there is some variation in the established front yards across a block, the zoning code requires those new improvements, including totally new structures like what we're talking about here, 
and uh, or alterations to existing structures, the zoning code requires those to be located farther from the front lot line and the intent there is to preserve existing views up and down the street from the fronts of the neighboring houses and, and uh, so those views aren't being blocked by, by changes on neighboring properties. The zoning code does provide some specific exceptions to this uh, minimum front yard requirement where, for example, if one of the neighboring houses is set back more than 25 feet farther than any other house on the block, that house can be removed from consideration in these cases. Or another um, exception built into the code is if the uh, majority of houses along a block face have established front setbacks less than that district standard of 20 feet in this case, then the subject property can also have a smaller front setback, but still not less than the line drawn between the fronts of the neighboring houses. It, all this is to say that even though the neighboring house to the north is set back relatively far compared to most of the other houses on the block, and they are sort of trying to line up with a lot of the other houses, the, the burden of proof for meeting these specific uh, exceptions built into the code has not been met in this case. So considering the ordinance's emphasis on preserving the open front yards as orderly development, uh, staff do not find that the proposed variance would be in keeping with the spirit and intent of the ordinance in that case. For the third finding regarding essential character of the locality and potential for injury to persons or property, staff finds that this is met. The neighborhood includes a variety of uh, building sizes, locations of structures on, on properties, architectural styles across the low density residential range. Uh, the proposed setbacks is still 20.1 feet as uh, shown on this plan, which meets that district standard minimum of 20 feet, still provides a minimum amount of separation from the public right of way. Uh, the proposed design would also be in compliance with the side setback requirements on the north and south sides, uh, so from the neighboring properties. So staff finds that it would not be an issue in that regard. Uh, in conclusion, staff recommendation is that the committee uphold the decision of the Board of Adjustment and deny the appeal of, of their decision, which denied the requested variance to the required front yard. I would note that if the committee were inclined to uh, grant the appeal in this case, staff would recommend two conditions of approval for this variance. One uh, requiring approval by CPED staff of final site plan, floor plans, and elevation drawings, as well as an application for administrative site plan review for construction of a new single family dwelling. And a second condition stating that all site improvements shall be completed by May 18th, 2023, or two years from today's date, unless extended by the zoning administrator. These are kind of the standard conditions of approval that staff recommend for uh, any variance application involving new construction. Uh, there were a, a few written comments that were received after the Board of Adjustment hearing and after I think the packet for today's committee hearing was prepared. All those written comments should have been forwarded along separately from your consideration. Uh, I believe the appellant is in attendance during this uh, during today's hearing as well. This concludes my presentation, but I'm available for questions if necessary. Thank you for your report. Uh, we have very much appreciate it. I'll see if there are any uh, questions from anyone on the committee. Seeing that we don't have any at this moment, I'm going to open the public hearing. With this type of hearing, we give the appellant the opportunity to present their case. Is Nick Elders or his representative on the call? Mr. Elders, you're welcome to press star six to unmute. I am. Thank you, go ahead, Mr. Elders. Can you guys hear me now? We can, sir. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time, um, especially off the back of the prior agenda item, um, which seems uh, much more important than, than what we're discussing right now. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, I've, I've enjoyed actually learning about this process. I'm the, I'm the homeowner, so I, I don't do this uh, very often. And uh, Alex has been uh, great to work with. So he's explained a lot of these things to me and I've been trying to um, meet the meet the requirements to the best of my ability. Um, I think where we're really continuing to run into issues is 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 in that location of the of the home on the northern lot that Alex mentioned. Um, currently set at about 49 feet from the street, um, and our neighbor to the south at about 27 feet, 26 feet, puts us at about 38 feet back from the street. Um, when I do a I kind of did an informal survey of the area, the surrounding area, um, sort of an area south of Minnehaha Parkway, north of 50th Street, um, west of 34th Street, and east of Nokomis. Essentially, it's about a, an eight block surrounding area. Um, only, only three of the homes in that area out of the 133 that are in that area 
are, are set back from the street significantly. Everybody else is at a, is at a fairly standard um, line, which we were looking to preserve um, with, uh, with, the, with the construction of our, of our new property. Um, it feels like, you know, in, in some ways, the, the, set, the required setback to meet the rules actually pushes the new home back further away from the street, thereby sort of uh, increasing the lack of uniformity. Because <laughs> we, we, we actually like um, to be where our current home starts, which is in line with everybody else on the block. Um, that being said, you know, I think one of the things that I, I missed, because I, again, I'm the homeowner, I don't do these things very often. I think I did um, unintentionally mess up the where the, the variance request was uh, originally appeal or applied for at the 20.1 level. I after, only after I, we were declined did I actually kind of get out a tape measure and go out and measure that out. I actually want it to be at 27 feet. So if the committee would consider a 27 foot setback, not uh, 2020, which was the original request, um, I think that would be. A great thing for us. Um, I think a couple of other things that that are that are also driving the the decision to appeal. Um, when we when we look when we think about kind of the, the 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 functionality of the property in complying with the the current setback rules, which would set the house back at about 38 feet, it it really it significantly reduces the availability of, of yard space in the back and forces. Um, we have very active children. It, it forces them to play in the in the front yard closer to the street, which we feel like is a bit of a safety issue for us, um, which kind of pre presents some practical difficulty in complying. I think the other thing that we that we think about in terms of practical difficulty is there's um, just given the topography of the two lots. There's uh, our neighbor to the north has a, a extremely flat lot, and he is uh, next to us. Is there's a, creates a, a drainage issue. The further the home is set back in the lot, the more likely it is that all of the water is going to drain to his lot and not to the public right away. We feel like a, a home that is closer to the street uh, helps us eliminate some of the drainage issues that are currently um, that we're currently experiencing on the property. Um, I think the last thing I would say, um, you know, again, is is what we're one of the one of the prior in the prior hearing. One of the the main concerns that the committee at least expressed and perhaps was um, this concept of, of, of variant stacking. I think one of the members brought up this idea that um, while there's already a variance on this property from the prior garage, recognizing that that was the prior homeowner, not, not me that bought that um, variance and that this would be the second variance and that um, variant stacking isn't something that the committee likes. Um, to my knowledge, that's, that's not in the code anywhere. Um, so that felt like it was a little bit of a um, sort of a Personal preference, not necessarily um, the actual primary reason why you would why you would deny the variance. So that, but that was stated as one of the the prime main primary drivers. Um, again, we're we're looking to build the new home where the current home is um, in line with all of the other um, all of the other homes on our on our lot or I'm sorry on our block, and, and not be kind of unfairly pushed back due to the location of our northern neighbor's home, which I think was the first home built in our neighborhood in around 1908. Um, um, so again, I'll, I'll I'm happy to take any questions from the committee, um, but I'll, I'll kind of close out the public hearing portion of, of my. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Elders. Um, we'll see if there are any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Elders. If not, we'll see if um, there's anyone else from the public who'd like to speak to this item. I'll open the public hearing to anyone else and see if there's anyone else who would like to testify. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Who on the committee would like to comment on this or make a motion? Anyone? Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to grant, uh, move forward the grant the appeal. Uh, I want to thank uh, the appellant. Uh, for uh, if uh, hopefully my colleagues had a chance to look at the extensive um, amount of support from neighbors uh, that was given for this project. Um, I would like to move approval with the two um, conditions um, the staff has mentioned as well as kind of um, developing, um, making sure that we've got the, the reasoning for that as well. Great, thank you so much, Council Member Schrader. Council Member Schrader's motion is to grant the appeal and um, also to adopt the two standards 
that staff had suggested early in their report. Are there further comments or questions on Council Member Schrader's motion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That item has been resolved on the appeal granted. We'll move on to the next quasi judicial item, which is an appeal of the zoning administrator. And I would ask Mr. Liska to please give that report. Thank you, Chair. Board members of IT can pull up the presentation. Before you is an appeal of the Zoning Board of Adjustments. Uh, denial of an appeal of the zoning administrator. This property is located at 916 26th Avenue Northeast. It is zone C2. The appellant uh, appealed the determination of the zoning administrator that pet cremation is substantially similar to a crematory. This parcel is located just off of Central Avenue Northeast and alley separates this commercial zone uh, zoning and structure from adjacent residential zoning and residential structures. Next slide, please. The applicant reached out to the small business team at the city in May of 2020 and was told the city of Minneapolis did not have any licensing associated with pet cremation. Further, they were told to talk to uh, state and local agencies with this request. That information is correct, although not complete. Zoning should have been included in that uh, communication as well. And at that time, zoning would have issued the determination that this use was not permitted. Unfortunately, zoning wasn't included. And the applicant moved forward with this request. Ultimately, a new gas uh, fire burner. burner was installed at the time of the inspection. It was revealed by the building inspector uh, what this use really was. That's when zoning was contacted and followed up with that substan substantially similar use determination. That again, the pet cremation is substantially similar to a crematory. And that appellant appealed that decision to the board. Next slide, please. Pet cremation, pet crematory is not a listed use in the zoning code. When there's not a listed use, ordinance 525-80 applies. That's where the substantially similar use determination uh, done by the zoning administrator comes into play. Uh, in evaluating this proposed use, it was determined that this use is substantially similar to a use that does exist in code, the crematory. Crematories are a permitted accessory use only to cemeteries. More, they need to meet distancing requirements, separating the crematory structure from any external exterior lot lines. The crematory must be a thousand feet from, from any exterior property line. Next slide, please. The appellant argues that the zoning administrator's determination is incorrect and that the pet cremation should fall under the limited production and processing use. The appellant also notes the difference in, in what is being cremated, humans versus pets. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry about my camera there. Um, while this proposed use does align with certain components of the limited production and processing. The essence of this proposal does align with a cremation crematory to a much greater extent. Uh, further, Chapter 52160 definitions uh, guides us to use common definitions when words are not explicitly defined in code. The common meaning for a crematory, as defined by Miriam Webster, reads a furnace for cremating. More of the common meaning for cremation is defined again by Miriam Webster as the process of reducing a dead body to mostly tiny bits of bone resembling ash 
that involves exposing the body to a flame and intense heat, followed by the pulverization of bone fragments. Neither of these definitions are specific to a species. Based on the above reasoning, the zoning administrator determined that the proposed use of a pet cremation is substantially similar to a crematory. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, the Zoning Board of Adjustment upheld staff and denied the appeal of the Zoning Administrator. The appellant has now appealed that decision of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. I'll be here for questions. The applicant and his counsel are also available, and it's my understanding that the counsel would like to speak before the appellant. Thank you, Mr. Liska, for your report. We'll see if there are any questions from members of the committee for staff. And if not, then we will go ahead and proceed to open the public hearing. With this type of public hearing, we give the appellant an opportunity to present their case. I understand that Mr. Stewart is on the line as well as Stacy Woods, Mr. Stewart's attorney. I would ask uh, Mr. Stewart's attorney to go ahead and speak first. If you could limit your comments to 10 minutes, we would appreciate that. So either Mr. Stewart or Stacy Woods. Please press star six to unmute. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, this is Stacy Woods, thanks um, council member. Um, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'd like to cover a, a couple items um, to clarify um, the presentation that was just given. Uh, Jacob Stewart did contact um, CPED, Community Planning and Economic Development, um, exactly a year ago, it was May 18, 2020. And in his request, he specified that he was a C2 district, he was zoned C2, and he was specifically asking if um, cremation, his cremation business, could uh, be um, could operate in that C2 district. Um, zoning department is part of CPED. Um, it's, it's true that uh, Jacob did not get a contact number at zoning, but um, a new business is directed to go through CPED, which again, zoning is part of CPED. So if zoning should have been included, that should have been um, that should have been into CPED. Um, initiation. Um, so, uh, Mr. Jake or uh, Mr. Stewart, I'll just refer to him as Jacob. Thought he was doing everything correctly. He got approval through MPCA, no um, requirements at the state. So he proceeded to get financing and um, um, and installed uh, installed a burner with a permit. And so then in February of 2021. This uh, statement of clarification was provided uh, by Stephen Poor, the zoning administrator. And our, our main, our first argument is that the statement of clarification does not comply with uh, City Code 525.80, substantially similar use analysis. Um, that uh, provision specifically requires that a substantially similar use analysis um, must include a finding that the use either is substantially similar in character and impact to a use regulated herein, or that the use is not sufficiently similar. Um, so a finding must actually be included in that, um, in that, in that statement. And there, there was absolutely no finding. So there was just a conclusive, a conclusory, uh, statement that said the word cremation, you know, there's the word cremation and human cremation and pet cremation are substantially similar um, and therefore not allowed. So there was no analysis and um, the, the bare minimum of a statement of clarification is, is required um, by, by this uh, provision of the code. And it wasn't until April of 2021 that the zoning administrator did then attempt to supplement the statement of clarification. And 
the only the way he supplemented it was by defining Webster's definition of crematory. At no point were there any finding findings as to what Jacob's business was going to entail or um, any analysis of character and impact. Um, so then basically the next argument is that uh, pet cremation or what his intended use um, was, which includes pet cremation, is not substantially similar to human cremation. And we have provided um, a grant quite a bit of information, <laughs> so I don't want to totally repeat it all, but um, there, there's quite a few differences between um, his business and a human crematory. Um, the, the scale of it, the definition of an animal for animal carcass versus a human body, you know, a human um, um, body that is deceased. Um, you can't in Minneapolis. You cannot bury pets. You can bury humans. Um, no paperwork is required for the death of a pet. Um, the list goes on. Um, the the scale of it is is quite a bit smaller. So there, it, there's just no analysis done um, here, and there should have been um, because then it would have been found that his business does not is not substantially similar to uh, human crematory. In fact, the actual cre cremation portion of carrying paws is less than 10% of the business. At least 90% of what he's doing is literally uh, reaching out to grieving pet owners. He goes transports the animal. Um, you know these are. These are pets. I mean, we're not talking horses or large animals. Um, it's a small oven. It's like a commercial size oven. And he goes and retrieves them. And there's a grieving room. He provides um, information about um, grief. And then the actual process of cremating is approximately 10% of, of the scope of his business. And he does provide um, or produce these small memorial monuments with the, the cremains um, as well that people can take home. And it's a very personalized um, boutique-like service that um, is, is nowhere near, there's just really hardly any um, comparison to human cremation. Um, and I would also like to clarify that the, um, the zoning administrator is, is stating that our argument is that it's only similar to limited production and processing, but we have we have stated that it's similar to three, similar to three items because it's it's kind of a combined business where he he uh, actually does the cremation, but then there's also he pr produces these small keepsakes or um, other products. So there is a limited production and processing operation occurring, mm -hmm. and he also is producing small memorial monuments and there are some similarities to funeral homes. I mean, in the sense that they are animals and pets compared, I mean, compared to humans. So there's actually three um, permitted uses in the C2 district that are being provided here at his caring paws uh, pet cremation. Um, and all those three are are approved uses. Um, and then just to also mention, um, the largest human crematory in Minneapolis is at 4343 Nicollet Avenue, uh, Cremation Society in Minnesota. This is a C1 district, which is less restrictive or more restrictive than a C2 district. And that operation obviously was grandfathered in. It would not be allowed today, but it continues and the neighborhood has not, um, <laughs> I mean, the neighborhood is operating just fine, but this large human cremation operation, the scale of what he is proposing to do uh, on Central Avenue is, is, is quite a bit smaller. I mean, well, it, it doesn't even compare. Um, and, um, and so he, that is another reason why it should be reasonable to allow this in a C2 zone. Um, he's also been doing this since January um, when he thought he was approved and um, 
we are not aware of any anyone can you can't tell that there is this is even occurring because this crematory does not emit any smoke or smell um, and it, it's it's basically like an invisible use. I mean, there's not extra traffic, there's not extra parking, there's no impact on the neighborhood. Um, and it's also just one use of his entire building. He's continuing to operate the traveling photo booth and um, he has some other ancillary uses of his building. So he's owned his building, he operates it, and this is just a, another supplemental use of the building. For those reasons, I would request that um, the appeal be granted. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now hear from Mr. Stewart. Uh, Mr. Stewart, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, can everyone hear me? We can, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and Council Members. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, and of course, nobody likes death or death care or cremation. And, and frankly, you know, my stomach doesn't feel good thinking about it all the time and and I hope the the 26 page appeal if you guys were able to all read it I hope that didn't ruin anyone's lunches um, but that being said providing death care services to pet families I believe is a necessary needed service um, and as uh, Stacy had mentioned the actual cremation process is, is less than 10% of what I do and um, with respect to um, the substantially similar use analysis I I think cremating a pet hamster or a pet uh, parakeet is substantially different than cremating um, a human being. Um, I know that the city is extremely busy and um, there's all sorts of bigger issues at play. I mean, I heard that throughout this hearing today, um, but I hope the members also know that this appeal is extremely important to my, my family, uh, to the clients of, of Caring Paws and, and also to obviously myself. Um, you know, the appeal process as you are aware, exists for a reason. And, you know, I do think it's entirely possible that departments like CPET um, can make a mistake. Um, as Stacy alluded to, uh, there were no finding of facts included with the actual analysis. And, and while carrying pause may be, while carrying pause pet cremation may be similar to a human crematorium in name, um, you know, I see that just as, as saying an industrial farm is similar to a backyard farm. So it's similar in name. But not in character or impact. Um, and like Stacey had mentioned, the uses that we brought up, um, and I'll briefly go into those other uses of why it's more similar, but it's far more similar to the limited production or the funeral home um, or the memorial and monuments. And so, um, you know, if we kind of talk about some of the different items that I manufacture and produce, um, obviously I do memorial paw print molds, I infuse the cremains with goodbye notes and tributes. Um, I do ink prints. I make, um, actually make my own urns out of rosewood. Uh, we do laser etchings um, in a variety of material. We take the ashes and turn them into jewelry. Um, I'm even making an hourglass with the ashes. Um, as it relates kind of to um, a funeral home, um, my services are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I'm providing you know, grief and support resources, um, pre-planning services, as Stacey had also mentioned, transportation from, from clinics and private residences. I do a lot of referrals for pet families in need of euthanasia or in need of hospice or palliative care or even general uh, wellness care. Um, I do uh, non-invasive body preparation um, for families to have a memorial service at my facility. Um, I even have a full kitchen that families have used to kind of have 14, 15 members, other families come by um, to say goodbye. And so it's, you know, a human crematorium is not public facing. You can't walk into a human crematorium and, and bring a body to it. Um, a human crematorium only interacts with the funeral home. Um, whereas I am actually dealing with the, the pet owners, pet family. Um, I understand that there may be a concern that that if if carrying pause is, is permitted to operate, um, you know, we're going to see a bunch of similar services pop up in the area. Um, and if you'll allow me just quickly, I can explain why that won't happen. Um, for one, the financial barrier to entry is high. Um, after we content um, receiving approval, I had to obtain a loan against my house to purchase my crematory equipment. 
Um, we looked at the first two, couple first ring suburbs like Edina and also Invergrove Heights. They have had a similar service. Uh, they both offer similar services to Caring Paws. And those two businesses in those two different cities have been in business for over seven years. And I am the first business that's similar to them in seven years that has attempted to open. So it's not as if people are lining up to do this. It's, it's not a glamorous job. The work is grueling. Um, the hours are rough. The clients are emotional and can be unpredictable. And obviously seeing um, deceased pets isn't anyone's, anyone's dream job. Um, the other thing is that the overwhelming majority of pets pass away at clinics. And the clinics already have a relationship with a ginormous crematorium. So I am not serving the majority, and my competition is not serving the, the, the pets that die at clinics. Um, those are being serviced by a third party provider because when your pet dies at the clinic or is euthanized at the clinic, convenience is the most important thing. Um, the clients that I'm serving are, are people whose pets have died outside of clinic hours or who have been hit by a car um, who, or who died unexpectedly at home. Um, a lot of my clients have disabilities, or mobility challenges, and need assistance transporting a deceased pet from their home. Um, so my clients have cultural or religious needs that can't be met by other providers, um, as you can't visit a crematorium and be part of that process, um, with the exception of a facility like mine and the one that's in Edina as well as in Invergrove Heights. Um, and then, you know, also kind of regarding it takes a unique, an extremely unique set of skills to run a small business like this um, that's dealing with death and that's open 24 hours a day um, and that's interacting with families, experiencing extreme loss and grief, as well as having the technical knowledge to operate the crematorium oven itself um, and the ability to manufacture um, memorial objects. Um, I'd be really curious to know if City Council has ever even had um, a service like mine brought to it. Um, before. This isn't something that people are lining up to do. Um, and so I guess I, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. Um, you know, I, I ask that you affirm my appeal and, and continue to help me help others. And that's all I have. I know you guys are kind of short. So thank you for the time. Thank you for your testimony. I'll open the hearing to see if any other members of the public are in line to speak. Ask the clerk if there's anyone else on the line to speak. If not, I am going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's always interesting to get the background uh, information uh, from the appellants. Um, it does sort of bring in a whole range of other questions that might not jump off the sheet of paper as you read the analysis from staff um, uh, through the documents that we read in advance of the hearing. Um, and of course, it seems that we do have a you know, somewhat grievable situation in terms of how the communication took place between the different divisions. Um, but my understanding is the question before us um, is to make a determination on the finding uh, from the zoning administrator um, and um, agree or disagree with that and agree or disagree with the previous uh, review body uh, uh, determination that uh, was upheld um, that upheld the um, zoning administrator's determination and um, you know the obvious um, good intention and the obvious good service provided um, makes very difficult context uh, my reading of the determination though um, from my viewpoint um, i believe the zoning administrator uh, has it correct um, further analysis might find that we should actually look at the nuance uh, and difference that might be presented with a deeper analysis and understanding. Uh, maybe the scope of, of the activity, uh, though it is essentially um, the same um, in terms of what happens functionally, there could be a qualitative difference that is identified by the sheer difference in quantity uh, and thereby the impact. And so, but we don't have that before us. And I usually like to make determinations not based on speculation, but based on what's before us. And so I'm going to move to deny uh, based on that premise. 
The motion in front of us is to um, deny the appeal, which is with regard to the upholding of the zoning administration or administrator that cremation is substantially similar to a crematory. That is the issue in front of us. Councilmember Reich has moved uh, to support the zoning administrator. Are there other comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That item has been resolved uh, and the council sided with the zoning administrator. With that, we're going to move on to our two discussion items. Item number 15 is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund 2021 policies and procedures and notice of funding availability, uh, as well as uh, some contingency pool recommendations. And item number 16 is the 2022-2023 housing, housing tax credit QAP plan and procedural man man manual. I would first call on um, whoever is doing the report. I, it says here, Carrie Goldberg, on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Policies and Procedures Manual. That is correct, Chair Goodman. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Carrie Goldberg in the Residential Finance Division. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund is one of the city's most important and successful financing programs that assists in the production of multifamily affordable rental units. And I'm happy to present the 2021 um, program to you. I do think the wrong slides are up. So I would ask that maybe we pull the affordable housing trust fund um, slide packet up. Looks like that's on the screen now, at least the beginning. Maybe go to the next slide. They've asked for me to maybe attach the slide into the chat. Let me pull that up real quick. My apologies. Not your fault. This has been a day of technological problems. It's taking a minute, just one second. It's okay, Carrie, don't panic. This <laughs> <laughs> is just, it's just a lot of clicking. <laughs> I think any meeting that goes over an hour and a half is too long already. So we're up two hours. I'm just about there. All right, hopefully that is accessible. I'm not sure if the clerk wants us to click into the chat or that's going to be on the screen. Chair Goodman, we, we will be sharing it in just a moment. Okay. Well, as they get started and pull that up, I can go ahead um, and there it is. Excellent. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So the trust fund program provides gap financing on multifamily rental projects with 10 units or more. Uh, the minimum qualifier is that 20% of the project's total number of units must be affordable to households at or below 50% AMI. The funds are structured as deferred loans and require that the project be affordable for a minimum of 30 years. The trust fund implements a number of city housing policies by incorporating them into the program documents as requirements that need to be met or they are incentivized in the scoring component of our Notice of Funding Availability, also known as our NOFA. The trust fund program is very competitive and we are oversubscribed each year. The trust fund budget is comprised of three sources, which are CDBG and home funds, which are federal funds, as well as local funds. The amount and allocation of the budget is determined during the city's annual budget review process each year. 
And in accordance with the 2021 budget, this year we will be advertising up to 15 million in funds available. The program is also designed to comply with all state and federal funding requirements. And as staff, we underwrite these projects to comply with those requirements. Next slide, please. There are a number of factors that the city takes into consideration when recommending a project for an award. And as I just mentioned on the last slide, the city is required to comply with a number of underwriting criteria to meet the fiduciary responsibilities of managing both federal and local public dollars. The city has adopted a specific set of underwriting criteria that each project is required to meet. Another factor considered is scoring, which is used to evaluate the degree to which a project meets the city's goals, policies, and priorities, which are updated annually, which is part of what we will be presenting today. Projects are not recommended for an award based on scoring alone, however. Other factors are taken into consideration to balance out the wide variety of program goals and priorities the city has. These include the amount of secured funding a project has from other sources, as well as the size of any funding gaps, which affect the time frame a project can close. In order to bring needed units to market as quickly as possible, the city works to award projects that can achieve a closing and begin construction in a timely manner. Other factors considered in award timing are geographic location of projects, comprehensive plan guidance, anti-displacement policies, and new this year is emerging developer status. Next slide, please. There are a few changes to the program this year for 2021. Most of them are minor and administrative in nature, but this first major policy change I want to really highlight is the application of the city's community preference policy to the trust fund. You'll recall that in the fall of 2020, as part of the city's anti-displacement and racial equity work, the city adopted a community preference policy for housing programs after hearing the results of a study that Kira conducted on community preference policies and potential fair housing implications. The community preference policy gives residents residing or formerly residing within certain geographic areas preference for specific city housing programs or housing projects. The goal of the policy is to disrupt involuntary displacement of Minneapolis residents, which disproportionately affects Black, Indigenous, people of color, and immigrants. The community preference policy was applied initially to the Minneapolis Homes Program with the goal of applying it to other programs as details about how the policy would be implemented when that was figured out. Staff is now ready to implement this policy for the trust fund, and it will be as follows. 50% of the applicable units created under the Affordable Housing Trust Fund program will be prioritized for eligible res residents in the initial rental of those units. Eligible residents are former since January 1, 2007 and existing residents of the Neighborhood Stabilization Program or known as the NSP designated areas who self-certify to having experienced or being at risk of involuntary displacement due to extreme economic forces. NSP target areas were selected for use in the policy because detailed data analysis was conducted during the foreclosure crisis to identify areas where the highest foreclosure rates where the city should target interventions to prevent and mitigate the impacts of foreclosure. Of foreclosure. The NSP target areas also align with the Cura gentrification study findings. This policy will be applied to the extent it is not inconsistent with the requirements of other funding sources for a given project. Right now, Minnesota housing is the only known funding source that currently prohibits the application of a preference policy in multi-unit housing due to state administrative rules, and we are working with them on the implementation and incorporation of this policy. Next slide, please. And this is as a reminder, this map indicates the NSP area boundaries where households claiming community preference must currently or formerly live. Next slide. The next change I'll highlight for 2021 is the addition of an equitable development scoring criterion. This category is proposed for projects willing to demonstrate a commitment to equity and inclusion through meaningfully involving community members most affected by housing instability and housing disparities to inform the project proposal. The project must then also demonstrate how it is responsive to the needs identified by that community and prevent unwanted displacement. This new addition matches a new scoring criteria that has also been added by Minnesota Housing. Next slide, please. 
There are two more significant changes I want to quickly highlight. First is a change to the way we evaluate project costs. Staff's recommendation is to evaluate and ensure cost reasonableness through the use of Minnesota's housing predictive cost model rather than through scoring. Cost containment remains a guiding principle. Given great need for affordable rental housing, constrained resources, and continues to be incentivized through bidding requirements and evaluated throughout project underwriting and selection. Elimination of the scoring category allows our cost containment principles to better align with factors related to other important city priorities like serving larger families, expanding the geographic distribution of affordable housing, increasing the energy efficiency and sustainability of housing, and supporting long-term affordability by considering long-term cost savings as opposed to only the upfront cost of construction. In addition, Minnesota housing has also moved away from the scoring criterion and is no longer publishing the cost containment benchmarks the city has historically relied on to implement this point category. And then lastly is to point out that there were significant updates to the Enterprise Green Communities guidelines in 2020 that raised the bar on green and sustainable elements to maximize energy efficient, efficiency, water efficiency, and healthy living environments. Staff proposes to adopt the new 2020 Enterprise Standards as our base criteria and similarly adjust our energy efficiency scoring to further incentivize even higher building performance in that area in support of the city's sustainable building policy and carbon reduction goals. Next slide. In accordance with the city's 45-day neighborhood review requirements, the program policies and procedures and NOFA were sent to all neighborhood groups on March 16th. Materials were also shared with the Housing Development Notices RFP Gov Delivery email notification list, as well as posted on the city's website. In addition, staff met with developer focus groups to discuss the community preference policy and presented the program, uh, the 2021 Trust Fund Program and NOFA at the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Housing. At the request of Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative, Staff also met with Beacon staff and community members in February to debrief the 2020 trust fund selections and discuss the upcoming 2021 um, trust fund round. All written comments received to date are attached to this request for council action. The Minneapolis Consortium of Community Developers submitted comments in strong support of the community preference policy. Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative submitted comments in support of the equitable development criterion and with several suggested changes related first to the desire to differently target trust fund resources to those with the lowest incomes, specifically re recommending setting aside 30% AMI awards goal, changing the definition of the primary purpose of the trust fund, and then eliminating selection criteria outside of scoring and then also their second change proposed, changing parks and open space scoring. Next slide, please. Staff is not recommending adoption of these changes proposed by Beacon, and I'll take just a few more minutes to address why. Generally speaking, we agree with the spirit of Beacon's emphasis on deeply affordable units. There is no question there is tremendous need for more. This is why at the direction of this council, Many changes have been made in the last three years that have created multiple funding incentives, multiple scoring incentives, and multiple policy revisions in support of, de of deeply affordable and homeless designated units. To highlight just a few, we have increased funding awards for deeply affordable larger family units. We have incentivized inclusion of 30% AMI units through utilizing both project-based voucher rent subsidies and income averaging. We incentivize housing with support services and homeless designated housing, and we piloted and then permanently incorporated funding for SRO units, which also aligns with an upcoming ordinance change in support of this deeply affording housing style that is currently missing from our housing continuum. It is the number one job of staff to utilize limited resources to maximize the production of affordable housing and deeply affordable housing in every funding round. And the approach as directed by current program rules is accomplishing that. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide, please, thank you. Um, this slide details the results of our current approach. 
The first column shows our historical average number of units produced, which you can see was 330, and our average number of 30% AMI units, which is in blue, and you can see that was 41. And that was from the years of 2011 to 2018. The orange, horiz orange horizontal line indicates our adopted Met Council production goal. And as you can see, prior to this mayor and council's funding and policy commitments, we were falling short. Since 2018, however, you can see that we have closed financing on a growing number of affordable units overall, well exceeding both our historical average and our Met Council goal. And importantly, in the blue bars, you can see new 30% AMI units increasing from an average of 41 to 105 in 2018, um, 128 in 2019, and 273 in 2020. That's a six-fold increase. This is because the current trust fund policies prioritize deeply affordable housing to the greatest extent that is feasible. The trust fund program provides gap funding and must be paired with other substantial subsidy sources that take time to assemble to create deeply affordable units at 30% AMI. So the trust fund also supports the production of housing affordable to households with incomes between 31 to 50% AMI to ensure that the city is maximizing the overall production of affordable housing. We should also note that 76% of runner households in Minneapolis with incomes in this 31 to 50% range are cost burden, meaning they pay more than 30% of income for housing, which also affects housing stability. But getting back to the deeply affordable units, such housing is much more difficult to produce and takes the longest time to assemble all the needed subsidy because these projects cannot carry any debt. Every single round staff analyzes funding requests to first maximize. Um, and just one moment here, I want to say yes. Every single round staff analyzes funding requests to first maximize the number of 30% units that can be timely completed and second to maximize the production of overall affordable housing um, overall. Setting funding targets for specific affordability levels in advance of evaluation of actual proposed projects and evaluation of all needed subsidy sources availability would actually result in money sitting unutilized, which means fewer new affordable units overall and fewer deeply affordable units. Blending 30% AMI units into projects that also have 50 and 60% AMI units is the fastest way to produce deeply affordable units and leverage more investment from other private and public sources. As we see in the chart, city investment using the current approach and in close collaboration with state and county partners has resulted in unprecedented affordable housing and deeply affordable housing production over the last three years. I'll conclude this section just by noting that the industry overall is shifting in response to these meaningful program changes. In 2020, every project that received a trust fund award included 30% AMI units. This has never been the case before and wouldn't have happened on its own. It is the direct result of the policy changes you have been adopting, emphasizing the need for deep affordability and increasing the pace of overall production. I'm only going to briefly just mention the last proposal um, that Beacon suggested, which was the parks scoring change. And you can look at that a little bit closer in your RCA, but I will point out that 98% of the area of the city would be within the distances they are proposing, and it would render the scoring criteria meaningless. Next slide, please. Our last substantive topic today is for staff to request a set aside of 1 million of uncommitted trust funds for the contingency pool. The council has twice approved a set aside of funds from the trust fund budget for special one-time additional gap funding for projects caught in the development pipeline. The contingency pool operates under criteria which are specified in the report. To date, 3 million has been deployed to seven projects through this strategy, resulting in the successful closing or completion of 500 units that were previously unable to close. Staff does return to Council with recommendations on specific awards as needed. With the proposed set aside, the 2021 Trust Fund NOFA will still have the full 15 million budgeted for the 2021 applications. Next slide. 
To conclude, this last slide shows the process and timing for the trust fund. I won't go over it in great detail, but as you can see, this program runs on an annual cycle that truly takes the whole year. And as I mentioned, it is highly competitive and oversubscribed each year, typically at least two to one. And with that, staff recommends approval of the 2021 Affordable Housing Trust Fund Program policies and procedures in NOFA, as well as the 1 million for the contingency pool. We are excited about these proposed changes and believe that we will have meaningful impact addressing housing disparities for years to come. I can now take any questions that you have, and I believe Angie Skildum is also available for any questions that might pop up as well. Thank you, Ms. Goldberg, for your report. We'll see if there are any questions or staff or comments. If not, I believe Councilmember Gordon has an amendment. Um, I do, I have a staff direction, um, but first I want to say that it wouldn't amend um, the action, so I'm fully supportive of the action that um, is recommended. I think that we um, ended up with a great um, program policies and procedures. I really appreciate the community preference being built into that. I know it's taken us a while to roll that out. Also the equitable development scoring, very significant. And of course, the uh, green communities, as they increase their criteria, we should certainly be adopting those. Um, I think that's absolutely important. Um, I would love to move that forward also with the contingency pool, but I do also want to move a staff direction and why don't we take that first? I think in that um, I will note um, that I really appreciated the briefing that I had with staff and I also really appreciate the thoughtfulness with which you took the comments that we got and there were a lot of comments on this and a lot of feedback. The one thing that resonated with me was the possibility of creating some kind of goal and doing more. Um, I hear from people um, regularly about we have to be investing more in the deeply affordable housing. And I know we're trying and I know we're doing and I know we're meeting with success. I've also heard um, even the mayor say that we should we have a, should have a goal of a certain number of units that are um, funded each year or I'm not exactly sure what it was, but others talk about the goal. So I thought that um, it might be helpful to us uh, if we could have that as part of the discussion next year and tee it up now. So maybe we can show the staff direction uh, that um, if the clerk could so um, and I can read it out loud as well. So this would direct staff to analyze the impact of having a goal of ensuring that at least 50% of all the units funded through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund be units that will <clears throat> be income restricted for households making 30% of area median income and report back to the appropriate committee in the first quarter of 2022 with recommendations that include options for accomplishing the goal. Analysis will include stakeholder input. Um, I know we heard a little bit about your thoughts on this already, and I think that's good, and that maybe means that the research and the work is going to be that extensive, and also this is aligned with when we're typically working on this already. I'm happy to take questions on this or suggestions, but I will move this uh, staff direction. Are there questions or comments on Council Member Gordon's staff direction? Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Council Member Gordon, for, for bringing this uh, forward. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, just to be very clear about it, I'm not uh, supportive of this yet. Uh, I think limiting staff uh, to look at just one year uh, is going to limit the amount of new uh, housing that we're going to get at 30 percent uh, ami uh, i really appreciated all the um, analysis and thought that's gone into our current policy and i appreciate staff giving that background uh, because my i think our all of our goal is to produce the most um, affordable housing we can in a given year with our limited dollars um, so while i'm not supportive of this and will not be uh, voting for it today I, I am interested in something that would be uh, looking over a longer term because uh, i think you're right councilmember gordon we knew, do need to have some kind of goal uh, to hold ourselves accountable to it uh, i just think the one year is going to limit the um, the effectiveness of all of the other uh, kind of guidelines that we have in place councilmember ellison i uh, really want to appreciate councilmember gordon for bringing this forward uh, if we do vote on it today, I, I would support it, but I also want to affirm that uh, I do think that this could be strengthened and that we could be uh, and that we could um, be exploring, I think, a more uh, 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 robust way um, and working with staff to talk about how we increase capacity. I know there, there's long been conversations about 
how do we get dedicated dollars in the trust fund and and um, and all of that? And so, if it if we uh, didn't vote on it today, but maybe this came forward at Cal or at the full council, I'd love to work with Councilmember Gordon to figure out um, uh, how we can create a staff direction that looks at a longer term and and maybe um, uh, uh, also looks at increasing our capacity. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'll just kind of that's more of a comment. Uh, I will vote for it if it comes forward, but I but I do think that we could improve the staff direction um, and 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 put it in a condition that would allow um, I think everybody on the on the committee to to support it. Council member Reich. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and probably similar to the comments just made by my colleagues. Uh, very intrigued by the notion of uh, production goals. Um, I too don't think we're putting it in the total comprehensive framework that that would require at this point in time. Um, I think staff has sort of given us where we're at now and why we wouldn't do that now argument. It's pretty clear. Uh, to me, the avenues that would be more interesting to explore would just be overall production vis-a-vis -vis baseline dollars put into the funds how we coordinate with outside funds that ultimately need to be leveraged, and maybe even new funds that are specific to targeted outcomes uh, that are standalone and thereby do not have the negative impact on overall production that was outlined by staff rather concisely uh, today. Um, so I'm more interested in that, that, that bigger picture um, approach that my colleagues have alluded to, and I do not think we can have conversations without broader budgetary uh, discussions. Um, as well as coordinated funding discussions as part and parcel of that. And I also will note, directing staff to do things um, is a big deal. And we have project opportunities that would be making production of actual units that are on hold because they take some pre-planning, some analysis, some actual staff work to make that are prerequisite for a project to move forward. That's not being done because of staff capacity issues. I just wanted to highlight that because there's a level of frustration that actual production projects cannot move forward at this point in time because the pre-work, um, there isn't staff capacity to do that pre-work. And yet we still want to have new projects uh, put upon them at this time. And so that needs to be part of the conversation too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member Osman. Yeah, I just want to take time to thank the staff for their work and also uh, I would say it's great to create uh, uh, more affordable housing, but also we do have a, a large population that I cannot and might not be able, able to afford uh, paying 60% MI and 30% is what they rely on. So it's, it's really good to have some kind of goal of moving forward. Uh, so thank you. That's all I have. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Osman. Um, I guess what I would say is today was supposed to be like a thank you to staff for all of the incredible work that they've done to show us the results from these past three years where they've figured out how to leverage um, money to get the most units possible at the same time they're still getting large numbers of 30% units, more probably than all the other cities, including St. Paul and the suburbs combined would be my guess. This goal of having 50% units, 50% uh, of the units funding at 30% of the area median income would just simply mean we do less units. So uh, which is it? We want them to be deeply affordable and a lot less of them, or we want to have a good mixture, especially when they're income averaged and in projects. So I feel like what you're doing is kind of saying this isn't good enough after <laughs> we just heard a report about how well the current policies that have been in place are working and in fact growing the number of units as well as the 30% units based on the intelligence and knowledge of the staff that we have. Then we have all of these issues with ongoing staff directions, but no additional resources or additional staff. So the truth of the matter is really important things have to happen, including closing 10 unit, 10 different projects as well as working with all of the rental assistance and now working with the federal money that's coming our way, all with the same number of staff people to do the same number of work. And instead of saying, oh my God, that's incredible. We've met these wonderful goals. We're saying, well, that's not good enough. Now we want this other thing and please study that. 
And I really feel like it's demeaning to the people who are experts and know what they're doing to suggest that they haven't done a good enough job and here's now one more thing we want them to do. Um, I'm, I'm just perplexed by it and I feel like we should and have told staff what we want them to do, which is meet a production goal and get as many units at 30%. We saw a slide that said they've done better. They, for us, have done better this year than any other year and the chart goes up and it exceeds the Met Council's goals. And now we're essentially saying, do something else that's kind of different than what we told you to do, but no one's saying, but that's okay if we don't build as many units. So I feel like we're not giving good direction here, and so I can't support the staff direction. Um, and if we want to completely change the way we're doing things, there's a time for that, but it's not in a staff direction like this. Um, so it's, uh, Council Member Gordon. Well, I appreciate that, and I certainly wasn't trying to put blame on anyone other than the policymakers, I guess. I mean, we uh, staff did a great um, job of helping us develop policies in the past that led us to where we are now and are implementing them with um, expert skill and efficiency. Um, this was something that I thought could give us some information and I would suggest that it, if, it, if the information we got back in a 10 or 11 month time period um, was helpful in saying we actually need a multi-year goal I mean, this staff direction should be open to provide for that. Or maybe we need a 40% um, goal, or maybe we don't need a goal at all, and here's why. Or if you really wanted the goal, here's how many units you would lose and the overall picture of things. So there's information, I think, that we or a future council could have that they could really benefit from and understand this better. And we may find that, oh, if you really wanted to target to more deeply affordable units, Here's what it would take. Here's what would be the risks and the policymakers at that time. And I even would bet with a recommendation from staff would say, let's move here now so that we can get there and we can do that and, and have that um, long lasting great impact. I um, am celebrating and I'm cheering and I'm grateful for all the fantastic work that um, staff did. I'm also open to ways that we could tweak and um, fix the staff direction. I would say we can do th those if it passes today or even if it doesn't, we can come back at the council and look at that again. And I would also think that we're gonna keep working and rolling up our sleeves no matter what happens to make sure that we're funding more deeply affordable housing so that those people right now who don't have anywhere to live, um, or except perhaps a shelter or except perhaps a car or perhaps a friend's house and a couch and all those other places will get more um, housing in the end. So um, my intention with this was to be complimentary, um, to help us understand um, some more information in the future so that we could make better decisions about this and kind of have it answered in the normal process of things when we're already looking at the scoring and what we're gonna do for our next notice of funding availability um, next round. So it wasn't intended to add a whole lot of staff work um, onto them. I'll say um, I did want it faster but I recognize that, oh, that would tie up some other work that's going on this year. So let's make this something that could um, be developed and brought forward next year. Uh, thank you, but Council Member Gordon, I'm not questioning your intent. I mean, you asked our housing director this at 8.30 last night. She then responded to you at 9.30 last night and told you why they didn't think this was a good idea and said that they were overworked and had too many things going on and they expressed in their report why they think there would be trade-offs here. So they've told you in no uncertain terms, they don't have time and they don't think it's a good idea. And so your response is, well, study it more. So either you trust what they're saying or you don't. And it sounds like through this motion, you don't. And that's okay, I respect that. I don't question your intent, but don't ask them to give the report, to give their feedback and then say, well, I don't believe you because that seems to be what's happening here. They have been clear. You can ask Ms. Skildum. She's on the call. Is this a good idea? And will this help us build more affordable housing? And they said no. <laughs> and you said, okay, well, study it then. So, I mean, if we want to just keep peppering them with staff directions, it's demoralizing. That's why I'm saying this out loud. And I think we all have to recognize it's demoralizing to our housing staff to not take one minute to say good job and spend plenty of time offering up staff directions. So I just want to point that out. 
I would have been delighted if it was a 30 second staff direction and a vote, so I'm sorry if it took up too much time. I also was delighted to accommodate uh, the work plan and make sure that it fit in with that and really appreciate the advice and the guidance um, from staff and recognize the very important roles that we play as policymakers and staff plays and want to do my work as respectfully and with this deep appreciation and, and um, love for our great and fantastic staff and this division in particular is excelling at what they do um, and has shown some good good ability to pivot and move with policymakers to move us in the right direction and we have been working together uh, this entire term as you noticed with the progress we've been making and hopefully we will continue to do that next term uh, and even digging in with getting some more information and some more ideas about how we can improve uh, the production of deeply affordable housing. Anyone else like to comment? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll on Council Member Gordon's staff direction. Council Member Reich. Hey. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. No. Uh, no. Chair Goodman. No. There are three ayes and three noes. That motion does not pass. Uh, Council Member Gordon, would you like to move the main motion of the Housing Trust Fund program policies and procedures and the notice of funding availability as well as the contingency pool recommendation? I absolutely good. I would, and I'm, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, this is fantastic and it's a day to celebrate. Maybe we should celebrate a little bit more after the next staff report too, because we've got some great news also with our um, uh, tax credits, but I'm um, delighted to move this uh, and very grateful for all the work that went into it. On Council Member Gordon's motion, are there any further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. Thank you, that is approved. And then I saw that Council Member Ellison had his hand up and I just wanted to take a moment to call on him should he have wanted to say something, I'm sorry. I didn't see that before the clerk started calling the roll. Uh, okay, I, I think our previous discussion uh, sort of got in the way of me uh, making the comments that I wanted to make, which which is to appreciate um, all of the work that staff has done. I think that these, when you look at the data, there's really it's really hard to argue with, right? Like we have um, we've done an incredible job um, um, as a city, uh, and that really starts with uh, with the housing team. Uh, I know that. Uh, uh, you know, no programming is going to be perfect. You're going to still people have still uh, have folks giving their critique and maybe some really valid critique. But I think that when you look at the data of where we were and where we've been and you look at the changes that we're making, when you look at the um, the preference policy, I remember uh, being in Austin uh, and seeing their preference policy, uh, you know, and, 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 and being with Director Brennan and with Katie Topinka and looking around and saying, wow, this is a this is an incredible resource. I think that communities in Minneapolis need this. And so to come to see it coming to fruition here is just really incredible. Um, and to have been a part of that work is really incredible. So I just, you know, didn't want uh, some of the earlier discussion to get in the way of congratulating staff and, um, and, and thanking staff for the work that they have put in uh, to make all of this happen. And I, I guess that could have waited until the full council, but uh, just wanted to give my comments here and show my uh, show my appreciation. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. I would encourage you to make those comments at the full council meeting, especially as it pertains to the preference policy, um, which is something that you and Council Member Ellison and others have been working on as it pertains to displacement. So I think it's a big deal. And I would invite you to talk about it at the council meeting also. Our last uh, item, is item number 16, which is the 2022-23 housing tax credit, QAP and procedural manual. And I will call on Ms. Geisler for that report. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I'm Amy Geisler. I'm a supervisor with the residential finance team in CPED. And I am here today to tell you about the year 2022-2023 housing tax credit qualified allocation plan and procedural manual which along with the trust fund is one of our primary programs that we use to finance affordable rental housing in the city. 
the tax credit program, as, as you all know, is a federal program administered by the IRS. Unlike the trust fund, the city does not directly award these funds to, um, to projects with this program. Instead, we allocate tax credits, which developers can use to seek investors for their projects. The city allocates our credits through um, our role in the Minneapolis St. Paul Housing Finance Board. There are two types of tax credits, 9% and 4%, and uh, we do an annual notice of funding availability for our 9% tax credits um, in conjunction with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And this year we expect to have about almost $1.4 million in 9% um, tax credits. Next slide, please. Um, as I noted, this is an IRS program. It has strict requirements for tax credit allocators like the city and tax credit project developers that they need to follow. 9% projects um, are competitively scored against each other. And as the council is aware, this is a very competitive program. 4% tax credit projects uh, must meet a minimum scoring threshold. And uh, the IRS requires strict project feasibility requirements and performance timelines for projects participating in the program to avoid the forfeiture of tax credits. Next slide, please. Um, with this slide, I'm going to highlight some of our most important changes that we're recommending as staff for this year, and those include increasing the minimum affordability term in the tax credit and the 4% tax credit uh, program from 20, 30, 20 years up to 30 years, and then incentivizing even longer terms um, up to 40 years with scoring. Um, we're also recommending the creation of a new 30% AMI unit category in 4% projects to further incentivize the creation of those units. Um, on the 9% side, we are proposing to combine the homelessness and supportive housing scoring categories, um, and then also to create a new equitable development scoring category on 9%, which is similar to what Carrie talked about on the trust fund side. We're proposing to add uh, or to strengthen our anti-displacement language for tax credit proposals that are um, being considered for existing buildings that are occupied. Um, and then we're proposing to make some adjustments to our cost containment approach very similar to what Carrie described for the trust fund program. We're proposing to implement uh, the new 2021 green communities criteria in the tax credit program. And finally, we are proposing to do a two year qualified allocation plan this year um, in coordination with the, the state, which is the state allocator. They recently adopted a two year QAP and we are proposing to do the same for the city, which means our next update would be um, begun in early 2023. Next slide, please. Um, similar to the trust fund, we uh, the draft QAP and procedure manual were sent to neighborhood groups posted on the city's website um, and shared to our uh, development notices list. Uh, we also presented these changes to the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Housing. Next slide. And we did receive a number of public comments on our draft. Um, we did receive support for extending the 4% affordability term and the new equitable development scoring category that I talked about. Um, we, re we received a request for clarification in our 9% disability scoring category related to the unit cap. And I wanted to note that there is an error in the staff report on this point, um, which unfortunately says we are not recommending this change. We are in fact recommending it, and you'll see the language um, as we are proposing it in the 9% um, scoring worksheet that's included with the staff report. So just wanted to note that clarification. Uh, we also received comments in support of reducing the number of points for 9% projects located out of ACP 50 areas. Um, the council will recall we have received similar comments in past years too. And we as staff would note that uh, the 9% scoring, it does incentivize tax credit projects outside of ACP 50s as part of its part of our strategy to locate affordable housing throughout the entire city across all of our housing programs. Um, but we do want to note it is not impossible for 9% projects to receive a tax credit allocation located within an ACP 50 area. Um, for example, the 3301 Nicolet project did receive a 9% allocation this way last year. Um, therefore, staff is not recommending this particular change. We received another comment that supported uh, the doubling of points for 30% AMI units on 9% projects, um, which staff is also not recommending. Uh, currently, our 9% scoring uh, already strongly incentivizes the creation of 30% AMI units uh, through a dedicated point category, um, which is often combined with points in our homelessness and supportive housing categories to kind of further um, incentivize the creation of those units. Um, and while the creation of those 30% AMI units is one of the city's top housing priorities, um, we are concerned that further increasing kind of the weighting of that category beyond what I've just described may dilute the influence um, some of, of some of our other scoring priorities, uh, such as uh, existing funding commitments and proximity to transit. 
And then finally, we also received comments in support of a requirement for all tax credit projects to be smoke free. Uh, the council may recall that last year we, we did strengthen our anti smoking language in our last QAP update, um, but we are not recommending that we proceed with a complete ban at this time. Uh, we would note that on policy issues like this, we try to stay aligned with Minnesota housing as the state tax credit allocator um, and the state does not currently completely ban smoking. Um, we also believe that to um, proceed with a, a recommendation like this, we may need some input from uh, tax credit legal counsel to implement such a change. Um, therefore, we're not recommending that we proceed with this change at this time, but we are going to put it on our list um, of updates to consider for the next QAP update. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is my last slide. This just kind of highlights some of our tax credit program dates for the year. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Geisler on her report? I'll note some of us will probably see this again on the joint board that Councilmember Gordon and I and Ellison have and continue to serve on in some capacity. Um, so we'll, because because we work collectively with St. Paul on this as well. Um, if there are no questions, I'm happy to move approval. I really appreciate all of the work. This is probably our most important source of funding truly affordable 30% units. 9% tax credits are an extremely valuable subsidy and should be reserved for those who are at 30%. And I feel like um, we can fund about one and a half of these projects a year with the credits that we get. And there are, um, there are a lot more projects in the pipeline. It's a very dedicated source, so we can be strict. And I believe we have been, and I think the strategy coming from staff is really excellent. And proof of that is that St. Paul essentially does what we do as well. So it seems like the cities are aligned. Uh, so with that, I, again, I have moved approval of the staff recommendation. Are there further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There, there are five ayes. Oh, uh, Ellison here. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. <laughs> aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. Um, seeing no further business before us, and unless I hear an objection, I'll declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all for your patience.